In this video, I'm gonna teach you how to build your own custom CRM just like Salesforce without writing a single line of code using a tool called Bubble. Before I say another word though, let's dive in and take a preview of what we're gonna be building today. Once I've registered an account within my application today, I'm gonna to be sent through to my account settings page. Now at this point in time, I've created an account not only as an individual, but I've registered as an organization. So what you'll see here is I have the ability to update all of my own personal details, as well as the details of the company that I've registered. So I can choose to update things like the employee count, or if I'd like, I can even choose to invite additional team members to my sales organization, which I'm just gonna jump ahead and add in the details of a new team member I'd like to invite. A few moments later. Then from here, if I select to invite this team member, Behind the scenes, that's going to register an account for that person. And then it's also going to send them an email with an access link. Then back in my own personal settings page, because I'm an admin of this particular company, I of course have the ability to view all of my own team members, as well as update any of their permissions or even remove someone from my account. Then if I was to jump over to my main CRM page here, this is going to display a list of all of the customers that belong to my sales organization. And of course, if I'd like, I can choose to add a new customer to my team. So in order to do that, all I'd need to do is fill out this simple form here and add in all of the customer's details. I can also choose to filter through this existing list. So if I open up my filter here, I can choose to filter this down by a company name, or if I'd like, I could filter this by the customer status. So let's say I wanna find all of my leads. And if I wanted to further refine that, I could also find all of the leads who are qualified customers. And so now you'll see I have a more specific list here. If I also wanted, I could choose to just jump into a customer's account. So let's say I'm interested in learning more details about this Batman account here for Bruce Wayne. I'm gonna click on this customer. It's gonna redirect me through to a dedicated customer page. And on this page, I'll see all of the details for this company. If I wanted, of course, I can choose to edit these details. So once again, I just need to update all of the information within this simple form. But let's say I just want a snapshot of where this customer is within their sales journey. What I can do below this is see a list of all of the activity that's occurred on this account. And if I'd like to add in a note, I can choose to add this button here and submit an entry, which is going to display in this list below. Then finally, we've also created this dashboard page, which just gives us a visual snapshot of where our sales organization is. So I can see a list of how many leads we have, how many customers we've closed, and how many customers we've lost. I can also visualize these within a pie chart here. And finally, I can see what the total value is of all of the sales won, lost, and what's currently sitting in our sales pipeline. And of course, your boy didn't just stop there. We've also added these date filters, so that way we can filter these values here by a particular date range. So let's say if I wanna filter all of these sales by the first week in February here, what you'll see is that these figures are going to update in real time. And now this is just a sample of everything I've created within our application today. Of course, there's so many additional things happening behind the scenes, so I can't wait to show you everything I've put together within this build. If you're a non-technical person like this guy, I'm sure you'll know firsthand how complicated it can be to bring your app idea to life. I'm sure you've probably tried to source a technical co-founder who could build the product, or perhaps you've even tried to learn how to code yourself. Well, I can tell you right now, anytime I've ever tried to learn how to code, it did not end well. And that was, of course, until I found Bubble. Bubble is what's known as a no-code tool, which in simple terms just means that it allows you to create fully functional applications without writing a single line of code. When it comes to no-code tools, Bubble is by far my favorite. Not only does it allow you to structure your own custom database, but it gives you complete control over the interface you create, as well as the ability to make your app functional using visual workflows, and of course, the ability to integrate with third-party tools and services. Look, if you were trying to compare Bubble to any other no-code tool, what you'll find is that each one of those features would be a standalone product. So it truly just blows my mind that Bubble includes all of this in one single platform. And look, if I can be real, who on earth would want to pay for four different tools when you could just do it with one? You smart. I appreciate that. Look, I feel like I've rambled on for long enough because there is so much that I want to cover within this tutorial today. So let's grab our Bubble editor and we can start walking through the process. 
Within our tutorial today, the very first thing I wanted to cover isn't actually how we can build a core user-facing feature. Instead, I wanted to take the time to set up and configure our own custom database, which will be used to power the rest of our Salesforce build. Now, in order to streamline the process of structuring our own custom database, what I've done today is I've gone ahead and I've created an overview of all of the different data types and fields we're gonna add into our application. And inside of this document, I've also gone ahead and I've created a list of all of the features I'd like to cover throughout this tutorial. As you can see, there is quite a few in my list today and I'm super excited to walk through all of these. Now, if you'd like to follow along with this list, I'll be sure to include a link to this in the description of this video. So that way you can make a copy of this and of course you can check items off as we add them into our bubble editor. But what you'll see at the top of my list is, as I mentioned, I have a series of what's known as data types and data fields, which we're about to add into our own Bubble database. And look, if you are new to creating databases in Bubble, I know the whole process can seem quite overwhelming, but don't worry, it's my job today to make things as simple as possible, so that way you can create your own powerful application without writing a single line of code. Now, when it comes to understanding how you can create and structure a database in Bubble, there's two core concepts you'll need to understand. There's what's known as your data types and also your data fields. Now inside Bubble, your data types are the overarching things that will be created inside of your database. So you'll see here all of my headings that sit above a checklist, they're gonna be my data types. And so a data type, as I mentioned, is almost like an overall entity within your database. So whenever a user needs to create a thing, that should be a data type. And so you'll see in my checklist here that we've got a data type for our users. And that's because of course, a user will need to register an account within our database. So a user is going to create an account, which means that will need to be a data type. I also have a data type for a company because within our Salesforce clone today, I want users to be able to create a company that they work for. And of course, invite team members into that company. We also have a data type for our customers because inside of each company account, team members will need to add customers or also known as leads. And then finally, I have another data type, which is known as customer activity. And so whenever a team member wants to add a note to a customer's account, they're gonna be creating that note within our database. And I'm just gonna to refer to that as our customer activity. But what you'll also see is within each overall data type, we have this series of checklists. And these are what's known as our data fields. So every single time a data type is created, we're gonna to need to store some information within that. So if I jump back up to my user data type, let's say someone registers a user account within our database. Inside of that, we're of course gonna to need to register some information about that user. So things like their name, their profile photo, their account type, and even the company that they work for. And so all of this information is gonna be what's known as our data fields. These are all the particular fields we want to register for every single data type. And of course, your boy here is always trying to make things as simple as possible for you. And so that's why today I've created a list of all of the data fields you need to add into your database. So that way you can just copy and paste these along. But I'll even go one step further and I'll walk you through the process of each data field we add and I'll explain why we're adding that particular field and how it's gonna be used within our application. So what we should do is jump over to a brand new bubble editor. And within this editor, I've currently made no changes to this application. The first thing I'll need to do though is of course set up our database. So if we head over to this data tab here, we're gonna open up our database and one thing you might notice straight away is that by default, we already have this user data type pre-created for us. And that is because in order for someone to actually use your application, they're gonna to need to register an account. So Bubble creates this data field by default because it's inevitable that you're gonna to need to create users inside of your database. And another thing I should point out is that on the left-hand side here, this is where our overall user data type is listed. But if I select on this, on the right-hand side here, you'll see a list of all of the data fields that sit inside that user data type. And by default, Bubble's already going to pre-create a series of fields under our user data type. Because of course, in order for someone to register an account, they're gonna need to store some information like an email and a password. And so that's why Bubble's already taken the time to create an email data field for us. And in fact, they also have created a password data field for us as well. We just can't see that for privacy reasons, but it certainly is there. So we won't need to create that within our own database. Now, when it comes to creating our database, the very first thing I'd like to do is add in all of our different data types before we then go and build out our data fields. And the reason I like to create our data types first 
is because what you'll notice in Bubble is that you have the ability to create what's known as a relational database. And look, I'm not gonna overwhelm you with jargon right now, but essentially in simple terms, that just means that your data fields can link out to your different data types. And I think that perhaps the best way to illustrate that is just by showing you a real example. So let's go ahead and just build out our database. And I'll point that out when we need to reference that particular link between our data fields and our data types. So if I was following my checklist within my Notion doc here, I can see that our user data type has already been pre-created by default. So the next data type I'll need to add in is our company. So I'm gonna jump back into Bubble here and I'm gonna create a data type known as company. Now, just a hot tip when it comes to creating a particular data type, please, 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 under no circumstances should you add a plural onto your data type's name. So I get that in your database, you're gonna have a series of companies. So sometimes I find that people add a plural onto the name of their data type. So they would call this, for instance, companies. But a user will only create one company at a time, which means that later on when you build out your workflow to actually power your application, it can get a little bit confusing if you think a user is going to create a series of companies when in fact they're only going to create one at a time. Now, of course, a user could create multiple companies in our database, but again, without sounding like a broken record, a user will only create one company at a time. And that goes for all of our different data types, not just our company data type. And so you'll never see me use a plural when it comes to the overall name of our data types in Bubble. From here though, I'm just gonna jump back into our Notion checklist and I can see that the next data type is our customer and then we also have our customer activity. So I'm gonna jump back into Bubble here. I'm going to type in the word customer. I'll create a new data type. And then finally, I'll do the exact same thing for our customer activity. I'll choose to create this. And that is all of the overarching data types we'll need to add into our database. Another thing I should quickly point out is that under our user data type, you may notice here that there's a default privacy rule that's been added onto this particular data. And if we were to click on that, what you'll see is that Bubble has pre-created what's known as a privacy rule. And in simple terms, this just limits who can actually see other users' data inside of your application. And under this default privacy rule, a user can only see the information and data that they create inside of your application. And now while that might be great for things like internal tools, or even things like to-do list applications where only one person will create an account for themselves and they'll be the sole user within that account. When it comes to creating an application where multiple users are going to interact with each other, we want every user to be able to see the data and information that other users create. So for example, let's say we work within the same sales organization. So the company that we work for is the same value inside of our database. If I was to create a new customer within our company's account, Technically, I want you to also be able to see that. I don't want myself to be the only person who can create and interact with that account. I want you to be able to see that information inside of our overall company. So this privacy rule here is something we actually don't want inside of our Bubble app. So we're just gonna scroll on over to this little trash can icon and we're gonna click this and we're gonna remove that. And what you'll now see is that our user data type is publicly visible, just like all of our remaining data types we've also created. Now, if we jump back over to our data types tab here, typically the next thing I would do in our database is just build out all of the additional data fields that sit under each data type. But today, just when you thought things couldn't be any more confusing, I'm gonna throw another spanner in the works. But don't worry, I'm gonna be sure to explain everything you need to know in as much detail as I can here. So if I jump back into my Notion checklist, you may remember that I'd mentioned when it comes to data types, we should create a new data type for every particular entity that a user creates within our app. So whenever a user needs to create something, that should be a data type. But what happens when we wanna create data in our database that we as the admins create, not our users? And a great example for this could be if we wanted to create some sort of permission structure within our application. So let's say I create a Salesforce account for my own company and I select that I am the admin of that company. And then if I was to invite you to join my company as an additional team member, I might like you to just be a sales member, not an admin. So that means that we would have different permissions on our own accounts, but how can we determine in our database how those different permissions should be structured? 
And I know that example might not be entirely clear, but I'll be sure to explain this in more detail when we add what I'm about to mention into our database. But essentially, if I was to scroll on down this list here, Bubble also has a feature in your database known as option sets. Now, if you're relatively new to Bubble, you might not be familiar with option sets, and that is completely fine. This is a slightly more advanced feature, and it just helps you take your database to the next level. But just based off my example I gave before, so the different account permissions. Let's say if I was to register an account, I'll want my account to be listed as an admin, and yours would be a sales rep. So just a standard salesperson. Now, instead of allowing your users to type in whatever permission they think they should have inside of their account, I want them to actually select from a predetermined list of two options. So they should be an admin or a sales rep. So as the creator of this application, what I'm gonna do is create two predetermined options. And these are the only two options that people can select from. And now why would I wanna take the time to create two predetermined options? Well, if you allowed your users to type in what type of account permission they wanted, there's no telling how they would actually spell this. So let's say some users might spell admin as administrator, or they might spell admin without a capital A, and then you'll start to have an obscure database because all of the values are completely different. So then when you go to build features for users who should be an admin, if someone spelled admin differently within their own account, you can't actually factor in for that user. And so this is the power of option sets. Option sets are kind of like a fixed value that only you as the admin of your whole application can create. So your users can't actually create option sets like data types. You're the only person who can create these options. And more often than not, if I'm ever using a dropdown with a list of predetermined items, I'll typically create an option set list so that way users can select from the exact spelling or options that I've listed out for them here. And of course, when we build out our application today, particularly our user registration page, you'll see a real world example of this in practice. But what I'd like to do is add this list of option sets into my database before we add our data fields, because what you'll see here is that some data fields actually link to our option sets. And perhaps a great example is within our user data type. So you'll see here there's a data field known as the account type. And to my example before, I only want users to select from two predetermined options. So you'll see that's why I've linked this field to our list of option sets, which is known as our account types. So what we're gonna do is scroll on down to our option sets here. And we're gonna add in an option set known as an account type. So if we jump into Bubble, open up your data tab, what you'll see is that in the top menu here, you have an option known as option sets. I'm just gonna skip this tutorial. If you do want a little bit more of an overview of how option sets can be used, I would actually recommend watching this video. And don't worry, I'm not gonna be offended. But if you wanna follow me right now, what we're gonna do is create a new option set list known as account type. And once that's created, what you'll actually see is that the process of creating our option sets is kind of similar to the process of creating a data type and data fields. And so on the left hand side here, you'll create the actual name of the option set. And then on the right hand side, you'll create a series of all of the predetermined items within that list. So you can kind of think of those items almost like the data fields for this predetermined data. And so within my account type option set list, I'm gonna add two options. There's gonna be the admin option, and then there'll be the sales rep option. And so now when a user selects to create an account, they're only gonna be able to select from this predetermined list. And that's just gonna help us ensure some consistency across all of our accounts. I'm also then just gonna jump back into our Notion checklist. I'm gonna tick off that we've finished adding in this list of option sets, and I'd like to add three additional ones. So there's gonna be one here known as our customer status. So let's say in our database today for our Salesforce clone, if we work for a company and we create a new customer or a lead inside of that company, what I'd like to do is just determine what type of customer that account is. So are they a lead, are they an existing customer, or are they an expired opportunity? And so by creating a series of option sets, it just allows me to create three fixed options. So that way later on, when we filter through a list of all of the customers who are currently leads, if the customer status is all spelt the same, so it's spelt exactly like this, we can then easily display a list of all of the leads and we can present all of the information about those leads. So things like the deal size, 
as well as the names on the accounts. So I'm gonna jump back into Bubble here and I'm gonna create another option set and I'll be calling this customer status. I'll choose to create this. And as you saw in my Notion checklist, there's just gonna be three options that sit inside of this. So a customer could be a lead, they could be an existing customer, or they could be an expired opportunity. And that's all we'll need to add here. So we're gonna jump back into Bubble. We're gonna tick these three options off and then we'll move to our next list of option sets. And so similar to the list we've just created, what I'd like to do is also create a way to determine at what point in the sales life cycle is a customer. So do they need analysis? Are they a qualified lead? Do we have to follow up with them? Has the deal been closed and won? Or perhaps it's been closed and lost. And once again, I wanna create this as a list of option sets because I wanna be able to determine what options a user can select from. And that's just going to ensure some consistency throughout our Salesforce CRM today. So I'm gonna add this list of options into my database. So I'm gonna create a new option called customer stage. I'll then add in my four options. So there's the needs analysis, there's the qualified, there's the follow up, and then finally there's the closed one and closed lost. And when we go to build out the actual CRM itself today, I'm gonna to explain how we can create some filters that allow us to filter out all of the customers who are let's say qualified leads or all of the customer accounts who have been closed and won. And these option sets are going to be essential throughout that experience. And then gonna jump back into our Notion checklist, tick off all of these option sets. And then finally, I have one last option set list here, which is known as our account activity. And so the purpose of this option set list here is to actually work in sync with our existing customer activity data type. So let's say on a customer's account, so if I'm working for a sales organization and I've created a customer who is a potential lead, if I was to click into that customer's account, what I'd like to do is be able to add notes to that account as that deal progresses through the sales life cycle. So let's say I ring the customer and they give me some important information I need to note on this account. What I'd like to do is create a new customer activity. And so of course, because as a user, I'm gonna be creating something which is a data type. So that's our customer activity. But within this, what I'd like to do is determine what type of activity has occurred. So have I just contacted the customer or is the deal actually progressing? And so if I scroll on down to my option set list here, I've just created two predetermined options that will allow our users to select what type of customer activity is occurring. So if the person has just contacted the customer, they can easily just select this option or if the deal has progressed. So let's say I win that account, we can select the deal progression option. And again, for our example today, I only wanna create these two options and I as the admin want to determine what those two options are. I don't want our users just willy nilly typing in whatever account activity they would like. I want it to be structured as these two options. And so if I jump into my bubble editor, I'm going to create another option set list called account activity. I'll choose to create this. And for the two options in this list, there'll be one called customer contact and another called deal progression. And that is the very last option set we'll need to add at this point in time. So I'm going to tick these off. And then if I scroll on up to the top of my Notion checklist here, it's finally at this point that we can start adding in all of our data fields under each data type. So the first list of data fields we're gonna add is gonna be under our user data type. So as I mentioned before, whenever a user creates an account inside of our database, I'm gonna to want to store some information in our database about that person. And so if I jump into our bubble editor, I'm gonna head back to our data types tab. I'm gonna select our user data type. And now we can create a series of data fields within this. And if I select this, the very first field I'd like to register is just gonna be the name of the user. So I'm gonna call this the name field. And then for every field you create, you'll just need to determine how you're going to structure that particular data. So if I open up this drop down menu, you'll see we have a whole suite of different options we can select from. So do we wanna store this as text, a number, a date, an image, a file, or even an address? Thankfully, in this case, this is gonna be super straightforward. I just want to store this as text in my database, and I'm gonna to choose to create this. 
Then whenever a user registers an account, I'd also like to store a profile photo for that person. So I'm gonna create another field. I'm gonna call this profile photo. Now, one thing I should point out is that when I create my data fields, what you'll see is that if I have two separate words, I'll actually connect these with a dash. And the reason I do that is because if I connect my data fields with a dash, but leave any data types with two words as a space, so similar to what I've done with my customer activity. Later on, when we're actually building our application, we can easily determine what's a data type and what is a data field based on how those two words are structured. So that's just a little tip I thought I'd mentioned that I personally use. For this field type though, as you probably guessed, a profile photo is just going to be an image. I'm gonna to choose to create this. Then when it comes to the next data field, what I'd like to do is link any user to a particular company. So that's gonna be the company that they work for within our Salesforce clone. And so I'm gonna create a data field known as the company. And now this field type is actually going to link to our existing company data type. So if I was to scroll down this list here, what you'll see is the option to link this data field to our company, which is of course our separate data type. So if you remember before, I mentioned the words relational database. This is where you'll start to see that in action. So in short, a relational database means that we just created a relation between our two separate data types. So if I was to just create this, what you'll see is that within our user data type, it now has a relation to our company data type. And that's because we're linking the data of a company through to a user. So if we ever wanted to reference the name of the company that the user works for, because this data field is linked to a company, which will be storing that information, we can easily pull and display any information about the company that this particular user works for. And of course, you're gonna see that in action quite a bit throughout our application today. But this is where you'll really start to see the power of Bubble come to life. Unlike most no-code tools, it truly is almost limitless when it comes to the possibilities you can create. And so at this point, we're creating a full-on database which I can completely understand why it seems so overwhelming if you're brand new to the tool. But trust me, it only gets easier the more you practice it. Now, if I just jump back to my Notion checklist, I can see that we have one last data field we'll need to add under our user data type, and that is the account type for this particular user. So as I mentioned in my example before, for every user that creates an account within my database, I'd like to determine if they're either an admin or a sales rep. And of course, we predetermined those two options within an option set list. So if I jump into Bubble, I'm gonna create a new field here, and I'm gonna call this account type. For the type of field here, what I'd actually like to do is link that to my existing option set list. So if I was to scroll on down to the account type option here, that's gonna link to the two options that we've created. So if I was to even open up this drop down menu, you'll now see those two options that were predetermined. So someone can either be an admin or a sales rep. And when we build out the page to register a user in a moment, I'm gonna cover how a user can determine which option they would like to be. But for now, that is all of the data fields we'll need to add under our user data type. So I'm gonna jump back into my Notion checklist. I'm gonna highlight all of these data fields and tick those off. We'll then move on down to our company data type. So within our application today, users will be able to create a company that they work for. And so we're gonna be storing some basic information about each company, so things like the name, the logo, and the employee count. So if I jump back into Bubble, I'm gonna open up our company data type, and the first field I'm gonna create is just gonna be called the name of this company. Of course, as you probably guessed, this field type is just going to be a plain text field because we're gonna be storing a text entry. We're gonna create another field, which is known as the logo. So this is kind of like the profile photo for this particular company. And of course, when we're working with images, the field type will need to be an image as well. I'll choose to create that. And then finally, I'm gonna create another field known as the employee count. And contrary to what you might think, I'm actually gonna select that this should be a text field, not a number. The only reason you should ever select a number in Bubble is if you ever wanna perform calculations on things. Whereas in this case, I only just wanna store the employee count as text because I just like to display that within a text field. I'm not gonna be performing calculations on that number. So it can just be text. I'll choose to create this. And that is all of the fields we'll need to create within our company data type. Now, by all means, I'm just keeping things pretty basic when it comes to the data we're storing under each data type for our tutorial today. But of course, if you ever wanted to store any additional information for any of these data types, 
please feel free to pause this tutorial and add those in as we work through them. You can truly store as much information as you would like, but I'm gonna keep things pretty straightforward. We're then gonna jump back into our Notion checklist here, and we're gonna head to our company data type and tick off all of those data fields. Then below this, I'd like to store quite a few data fields under our customer data type. So within each company account for our Salesforce clone today, team members are gonna be able to create customers. So these can also be known as leads. And for each customer a user creates in our database, I'd like them to store quite a bit of information. So this can include things like the name of the company that customer works for, the contact name of the customer, their number, their email, as well as things like the total deal size and even the customer stage of that account. And of course, I'm gonna be sure to explain all of these data fields when I add them into my database. So if we jump over into our bubble editor, we're gonna open up our customer data type. And the very first data field we're gonna create is known as the company name. So for every customer we create, I'm gonna to want to store two particular names. There's gonna be the name of the company that this customer works for. So if we're doing B2B sales or enterprise sales, we need to know who that person works for. And of course, because we're storing a name, this is just going to be a plain text field. But when it also comes to the names I'd like to store, I'd like to make reference of the person who is the point of contact within that company. So I'm gonna create a field here and I'm gonna call this the contact name. I can just see I have a small typo there that I'm gonna fix. And so let's say you were working for a sales organization and I was a potential customer or a lead for you. The contact name would be Lachlan Kirkwood because I am the person you're speaking to at my company. So for the field type, of course, when we're working with names, this is just going to be a plain text field. I'll choose to create this. And also for each customer, I'd like to store some additional contact information. So I'd like to know the customer's best email and also phone number. So I'm gonna create two fields here. The first will be known as the contact number. So this is going to be a phone number. For this field type, this is once again just going to be text because I'm only going to display this as a text field. I'll choose to create this. Then there's going to be the contact email and this will be once again a text field type. It's nice and straightforward. Then for every customer account, what I'd like to do is recognize who within my sales organization is responsible for that account. So I want a user within my company to be the account owner for this customer. So if I create a new field here, I'm going to call this the account owner field. And because I want a team member within my own sales organization to be the account owner, I'm actually gonna link this field type to our user data type because of course a user should be the person who controls this account. So I'm gonna to choose to create this. And of course, while this customer is active within our Salesforce CRM, what I'd like to do is determine the status of this customer. So are they a lead? Are they an existing customer? Or are they an expired opportunity? And if you remember, we've already created a predetermined list that has all of those options in it. So what we can do is create a data field that links to our list of option sets. So if I create a new field here, I'm gonna create a field which is known as the customer status. And for this field type, this is gonna to link to our customer status option set list. So if I create this, what you'll see is that for the options available, we can obviously associate the value of a lead, customer, or expired to any particular customer in our database. And of course, later on, I'll be explaining how users can update this status for any particular customer. What I'd also like to determine though is the actual customer stage within our sales lifecycle. So do they currently need analysis? Should we follow up with them or is the account closed? And so I'm gonna create another data field here known as the customer stage. And of course, if you remember, we've already created a predetermined list of option sets that someone can select from. So I'm gonna open up our drop-down menu and reference the customer stage. I'll choose to create this data field. And of course, this was the list that just displayed words like needs analysis, closed one, qualified, follow up, and closed, lost. That's all we'll need to create for these two fields though. What I'd also like to determine for every customer is the total deal size of this opportunity. So if we're gonna be cash and checks and snap and necks, we of course need to know the value of every single sales opportunity within our database. 
So I'm gonna create a field here known as deal size. Now this field type is in fact going to be a number because in our Salesforce application today, I'm gonna to create a dashboard page, which allows us to view the full dollar amount of all of the potential customers that sit in our sales pipeline. And of course, we're also gonna be able to filter those out by the different sales stages. And so I am gonna set this as a number, so that way we can perform calculations on this field. I'll choose to create this. And at this point, we're almost there for our customer data type. There's just two remaining fields I'd like to create. One is going to be the date in which this customer account closes. So if a team member ever updates the customer stage to either closed one or closed lost, what I'd like to do is pinpoint the exact date and time that that occurred. So that way later on on our dashboard page, we can filter out and display a list of how many sales have been won within a particular time period. So I'm gonna create a field here and I'm gonna call this the closed date. And of course for this field type, I'm gonna reference this as a date. I'll choose to create that. And then finally, the very last thing I'll need to do for each customer account is determine which company in our database this customer belongs to. So let's say you and I both work for two different companies inside of Salesforce. If we've both created customers within our own company, I should obviously only see the customers that belong to my company, and you should only see the customers that belong to yours. I should never be able to see the customers you've created because of course that would be a breach of privacy. And so what I'm gonna do is just determine which company each customer belongs to. And then within our CRM today, I'm only going to display a list of all of the relevant customers that belong to the same company that someone works for. So I'm gonna create one last field here, which is known as the created company. And this field type is gonna be linked to our company data type. So I'm gonna scroll on down, select this option and choose to create this field. And thankfully that is all of the data fields we'll need to add into our customer data type. It is quite an extensive list, but I just wanted to be sure that I broke down the importance of every single field as we were adding it into our database. So we're gonna jump back into Notion, we're gonna highlight this list and we're gonna check off all of these data fields here. And thankfully there's just three remaining data fields we'll need to add in, and that is within our customer activity data type. So as I mentioned, within every single customer account, team members should be able to create an activity event. So if they've spoken to the customer on the phone or an email, they should be able to update the account with relevant information. Or if potentially that account has progressed, team members should also be able to make note of that on the customer's account. And so if we jump into Bubble here and open up our customer activity data type, we're gonna to choose to create a new field. And the very first thing I'd like to do for every single custom activity event that is created is link that to a particular customer's account. So let's say if I was a customer for you. So you had a customer that was Lachlan from Building With Bubble, and then you've been putting in the work. You close me as a client, and then you take the time to update my customer account within your own Salesforce portal. You obviously only want to display the details of my account on my page. You don't want to see the customer activity that occurs for another potential account. So what we're going to do is create a field here, and we're going to call this field the customer field. So this is the customer that this activity will be linked to. So for this field type, I'm going to scroll on down and select that this should be linked to our customer data type in our database and I'll choose to create this. Then for the next field, I'd also just like to determine what type of activity event has occurred. And of course, that's gonna be linked to the list of option sets I've already created. And if you remember within that list, there's two options. There was the customer contact and then there was the deal progression. So if I create a field here, I'm gonna call this the activity type. And this field type is gonna be linked to our account activity, which is our predetermined list of option sets in our database. So if we open up this drop down menu, you'll be able to see from the two options we can select from. And then finally, the very last field I'd like to add is just a way for a team member to add some additional comments to each customer activity. So let's say they just wanna add some remarks about what the customers mentioned. So that way any other team members that view that customer's account can easily just see what has happened. So we're gonna create a field here and we're just gonna call this the comment for the customer activity. And of course, because we're storing a comment, this is just going to be stored as text. We'll create that. And thankfully that is the very last data field we'll need to create. So we're gonna jump back into Notion. 
I'm going to check off all of our remaining data fields here. And honestly, this was a huge database that we had to create today. I'm sorry this dragged out, but I really just wanted to take the time to explain this in as much detail as I possibly could. Just because I remember when I first started using Bubble, databases were the thing that I struggled with the most. And so I know this has taken up a large chunk of our tutorial today, but I definitely think it's essential to create the right framework and structure for your database in order to power the rest of your Salesforce application. Now that we've finished setting up our database for our Salesforce clone, what I'd like to do is start moving through the list of features I've set out for us in our checklist today. And for the sake of this tutorial, I actually want to jump ahead to this feature here where we're going to start building out the main CRM page. So this is going to be the page that looks like a database for each sales team. So of course, each sales team will eventually be able to add in their own customers. And this is where we'll be displaying all of the details for each of those customers. So we'll display information like who the point of contact is, as well as what deal stage this particular customer is in. And when it comes to this CRM page, you can kind of think of this as the main page within our overall application. So this is going to display all of the information that each sales team will need to know. And so what I'd like to do is start by jumping over into my bubble editor. And within my editor, the first thing I'd like to do is create a brand new page within my application. Now, we're not going to use the index page. We're going to save this for another page later on in our tutorial today. But instead, what I'd like to do is create a brand new page, and I'm just going to call this the CRM. I'm going to choose to create this. Then on my new CRM page, what I'd like to do is just double click on the page itself and open up my property editor. And of course, when I'm creating a new page, there's a few configurations I'm going to need to change in the beginning. And the first one is going to be our background color. I'd like to update this to be a shade of blue. So if you'd like that color code, it's once again, 009 EDB. And when it comes to this color, I'm also going to update the opacity here to be 10%. So that way it's just a light shade of blue. It's not as bold or tough on the eyes. Then once we've updated the color, we can jump over to our layout tab and we'll need to set a container layout on the overall page. Now, like I've mentioned in previous modules, when it comes to the actual page itself, not the groups that sit inside of it. Nine times out of 10, you're going to need to set the container layout to be a column because you'll be stacking elements from top to bottom on your page. And now it's at this point that we can start building out the actual elements that are going to create the page itself. Now, I thought it would be helpful to show you just a quick example of what we're going to be building today. So over in a separate browser here, this is just an example of what our CRM page will look like. And of course, this is color coded to show where all of my groups are. So eventually within our tutorial today, we're going to create this navigation menu at the top of our page. Then below that, I'd like to create this white group, which is going to contain a series of headings as well as a button and even an option to later on filter out our CRM. But below that, you'll notice we have this repeating group, which just displays a list of all of our sales data. And so right now we're going to focus on building out this white group that contains all of the information of our customers. So we're going to jump back into our new bubble editor here. And the first thing we're going to do is add a group element onto the page. And when it comes to this group, I'm going to first of all, jump to our appearance tab and just remove the style of this because what I'd like to do is add a flat background color and I'm going to keep that as white. I'm also then going to update the roundness of this group's borders to be 20. I'll then jump over into my layout tab. And when it comes to the layout of this group, I'll be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. So I'm going to set the container layout to be a column. Then while we're working on this group, I'm going to just quickly update the width settings. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width to be zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. And now this group is going to take up as little or as much space as it possibly can on my page. Now, if I was to just jump back into my existing bubble editor here, the first element you'll notice we have in our white group is another blue group. And this contains a text element as well as two buttons. And because these elements are positioned horizontally across our page, in order to create this experience, I'm going to need to add an existing group into my white group. And I'll need to set its container layout to be a row. So in my new bubble editor, I'm going to scroll on down to my containers menu once again, and I'm going to add a new group inside of my existing group here. Now, when it comes to this group, the first thing I'll do once again is head over to my appearance tab because I'm going to choose to remove the default style of this group. I'm going to give it a flat background color and I could set this to be, let's say, just a light shade of red. It doesn't really matter because later on when you preview or publish your application, you'll want to remove this background style. I'm then going to jump to my layout tab and I'm going to choose to update the container layout to be a row 
because as I mentioned, inside of this group, we're gonna be stacking elements side by side. So that means horizontally. And of course, a row is the correct container layout to bring that to life. I'm also then going to just unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always, I'll be setting the minimum width as zero and leaving the maximum width as infinite. And now, as you can see, this group here is taking up all of the space within our existing white group. But we're gonna come back in a moment and update our height and margin settings to fix that later on. But inside of this group, the first thing I'd like to do is just add a text element. So I'm gonna to head to my visual elements here. I'll choose to add a text element into our red group. And when it comes to this particular text element, what I'd like to do is first of all, display an icon inside of this, followed by the word leads. So of course, in order to display an icon, if you remember from our previous modules, we're just gonna add in a little bit of custom HTML. So I'm gonna start by adding in an open square bracket, followed by the letters FA, and then a closed square bracket. Then following this, I'm gonna add in the name of the icon I would like to display within this text. And in this case, it's just going to be called user. Now I know that because I've gone into my icon library already and I found out what the name of that icon was. Then finally, I can choose to close off the HTML brackets. So I'm gonna add another open square bracket followed by a forward slash, then the letters FA and then a close square bracket. And you'll now see that that will format that as a user icon. I'll then add in a space and just type in the word leads. When it comes to the style of this text, I'm also gonna remove this style because I'd like to update the font size to be 18. I'm also gonna choose to bold this font. And then from here, I'll need to update the responsive settings of this within our layout tab. So for the width of this text element, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. And I'm also going to update the minimum height to be zero. And of course, that just means it's going to collapse the element itself around the text inside of it. While we're here, I'm also going to vertically align this text in the center of my red group. And then finally, I'll just add in 20 pixels of margin on the right. And that is because I'm going to be adding some additional elements on the right hand side of my red group. Now, when it comes to the red group itself, as I'd shown you in my existing bubble editor, on the right hand side of this group, I'd like to display two buttons. And in order to create an experience where I can position this text element on the left hand side of my red group and two buttons together on the right hand side of my group, I'm gonna need to add in yet another group inside of my existing group. And I'll show you why I do that in a moment. But the first thing I'd like to do is just add a group element into my existing red group. And when it comes to this group, I'm just gonna quickly jump to the appearance tab. I'm gonna remove the default style of this and I'm just going to give it a flat background color. If I would like, I could make this something like a shade of yellow or even green if that's what it looks like to you. And then I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here and just move this to the next position within my group. Now by default, what you'll notice is that my new group has been moved to the right hand side. However, if I was to select in my text element here and tick this option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it, what you'll now notice is that our new group sits directly beside our existing text element. And that is because of the way in which our red group here has been structured. So if I click on my overall red group, you may notice that under our container layout, which is set to be a row, we have this option here to update the container alignment. Now the container alignment just determines in which section of this group our elements will be positioned. So by default, they're all positioned to the left-hand corner. However, if I wanted to center these, they would be positioned in the center, or if I wanted them all to be positioned to the right, they would all move across accordingly. But what I'm interested in showing you is this option here known as space between. So if I click this last option here, what you'll now notice is that Bubble has added an even amount of space between both of these two elements inside of our red group. So they're both being pushed directly to each side of the group itself. Now, if for instance, on our text element, we hadn't selected this option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it, you might not need to actually update the container alignment, but I just wanted to take the time to explain this to you in case you ever wanna build your own responsive experience. And when we build out a navigation menu later on in our tutorial, I am gonna reference this setting once again. But for the time being, what I'd like to do is just click on my new group here and update its container layout to be a row because inside of this group, I'm going to display two buttons side by side. 
Now for the width and height settings of this group, I'm actually not gonna make any changes to these right now. Instead, I am gonna come back and update these in a moment once I've finished adding my buttons into this group. So in order to do that, I'm gonna head to my visual elements and I'm gonna choose to add my very first button into this group. And this button's just going to display the word new. So when this is clicked, later on we're going to display a pop-up which will allow someone to add in a new customer into their CRM. When it comes to the layout of this button, I'm just going to jump to my layout tab here. What I'd like to do is just update the width of this element. And in this case, I'll be setting the width to be 100 pixels. And I'm going to keep that as a fixed width because I'm only ever going to want it to be 100 pixels at any given point in time. I'd also just like to update the minimum height to be 40. So that way it condenses the actual height of this element. And then finally, I'm just going to vertically align this button in the center of our second group here. Now, beside this, what I'd like to do is add in another button, which if I jump over into my existing bubble editor here, you might have remembered, but this button here just contains a little icon, which looks like a filter. So when this is clicked later on, it's gonna open up a series of filter options that someone can select in order to filter their CRM data. But one thing I should point out is that when it comes to working with button elements inside of Bubble, you're actually unable to add an icon into the button as text. So unlike our existing text element here, you can't just add a little string of HTML and format an icon inside of this button. In fact, in order to create a button with an icon in it, we're actually gonna need to create that from scratch ourselves. And the way in which you can create a button of your own is by using a group element. So if I scroll on down to my containers menu, I'm gonna add in yet another group inside of my existing green group. And the first thing I'll do for this group is actually update the title of this, just because this is gonna be a button in my application today. So I'm gonna to need to reference it in a workflow later on. So I'm gonna call this group filter button. I'm then gonna jump over to my appearance tab here. I'm gonna to choose to remove the style of this group and I'm gonna give it a flat background color. And when it comes to this color, I'm gonna set this to be the same shade of blue as my existing button here. So if you'd like that color code, it's 009 EDB. While we're here, I'm also just gonna set the roundness of this group's borders to be five, just so that way it has some slightly curved edges like my existing button. And then finally, I'll jump over into my layout tab here and update my container layout. Now, because I'm only adding one element inside of this group, it doesn't really matter if I select a row or a column. I do like to personally select the row option because it's gonna provide me with a series of additional settings here that I can change in order to get the alignment of that icon perfect in the center of my group. Then if I scroll on down to the width of this group, I'm gonna set this to be 40 pixels as a fixed width. Then I'm gonna select that the height should also be a fixed width and I'll be setting that at 40 pixels as well. So that way it is now 40 pixels by 40 pixels. I can also choose to vertically align this group in the center of my existing green group. And then finally, I'm just gonna add in 10 pixels of margin on the left. So that way this group here doesn't touch my existing button beside it. Now from here, what we can do is scroll on up to our visual elements and we can choose to add an icon element into this blue button. And for the icon, I'm just gonna search for the word filter and I'll select this filter icon here. I'm then gonna to choose to remove the default style for this icon, and I'm gonna set the icon color to be white. I'll then jump over into my layout tab, and inside of this layout tab, I'm just going to vertically align this icon in the center of my blue group, and I'm actually quite happy with the existing dimensions of this icon, so I'm gonna leave it at 30 pixels by 30 pixels. The last thing I'll need to do though, and I can see I've just forgotten to configure this setting, is just select on my blue group once again and update the container alignment here to also be in the center. So that means it's going to center any element inside of this group horizontally in the middle. So now if I was to click away, you'll see that that icon is going to be perfectly centered both vertically and horizontally. And look, that is all of the elements I'll need to add inside of my green group. So I'm gonna select on the green group. I'm then going to head to my layout tab and first of all, unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, but I'm not gonna leave the maximum width as infinite. Instead, I'm gonna select this option here to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. And now that just means that the maximum width will be the total width of these two buttons combined. And now you can really start to see that our menu is coming together nicely. I'm also gonna need to update our height of this group. 
So I'm going to set the minimum height to be zero. And then finally, I will select to vertically align this green group in the center of my red group here. And that is every single element I'd like to add into my menu. So to conclude this, I'm going to select on my red group. I'm going to head to my layout tab here, and I'm going to update the height of this element to be zero. And of course, because we have this default option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it will collapse nicely around all of our existing elements within it there. And then finally, the very last thing I'll need to do for this red group is just add in some margin around its borders. So I'm going to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. I won't add any on the bottom, but I'll also add in 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that's now going to ensure that this group won't touch the borders of my existing white group. And now I know that seems like a lot of effort to just build a horizontal menu, but of course this is gonna help us create a truly responsive experience within our application today. And so everything's gonna be looking a-okay when we run a preview of our application. Now below this heading, what I'd like to do is actually add in yet another group. And this is going to contain a series of headings of its own. So if I was to jump over into my existing bubble editor here, what you'll see is that I have a red group that sits above a repeating group here. And that just displays a series of headings to notify the user of what data they're looking at within each column of our repeating group. And so in order to create this red group, we're gonna jump back into our new bubble editor. We're going to head to our containers menu and add yet another group within our existing group. The first thing we'll do is jump to our appearance tab. I'm gonna to choose to remove the style of this group. I will set the background style to be a flat color. And for this color, we could make this whatever we want. I'm gonna make this a light shade of purple, just so I can easily see where it actually sits inside of our white group. I'm then gonna to jump to my layout tab here, and I'm gonna update the container layout of this group to be a row, because as you saw, we're gonna be stacking a series of headings horizontally within this group. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width is infinite, of course, so that way this group can become as small or as large as it possibly needs to be on this page. And now inside of this group, I'd like to add in a series of text elements that are going to act as our headings. So I'm gonna scroll on up to our visual elements. I'm gonna to select to add a text element into our purple group. And within our first heading, I'm gonna have this display the words contact name, because below this, I'm going to display the name of the sales contact. So when we're working on this element, I'm also going to remove the style of this, and I'll update the font size here to be 16. I'll also choose to bold this. I'll then need to make this element fully responsive. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab here. When it comes to the width, as you probably guessed, I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will be setting the minimum width as zero, and of course, leave the maximum width as infinite. I'm also then gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And then finally, I'm going to vertically align this in the center of our purple group. And now from here, all I'll need to do is just make a series of copies of this text element. And you'll see that when I paste in a new version, these are going to continually collapse and give an equal amount of space to each other. And for our next text element, I'm gonna have this display the word company because that's going to display the company in which someone works for. I'll make another copy of that. And then for this new copy, I'm gonna have this display the word mobile. So that way below this, I will display the phone number that belongs to the sales lead. I'll make another copy of that. And I'll have this heading display the word email. So that way we can display the email address of a customer. I'll make another copy yet again. And for this text, I'd like to display the words deal stage. So that way we can display whether or not this is a lead, an existing customer, or something that needs to be followed up with. And then finally, I'm gonna make one last copy here, and this is going to display the word owner. So within our CRM, we'll be able to see who the actual person is that's managing this account. It's nice and straightforward. And that's all of the text elements I'd like to add in. As you'll see, these will all have an even amount of distribution within my purple group. All I'll need to do now though is just select on the purple group itself, open up our layout tab here, and the first thing I'll do is update the height. So if I set the minimum height to be zero, because we have this option selected by default to fit the height of this element to the content within it, it's going to snap nicely around all of the text elements. But finally, I'd also just like to add in a top margin of 20, a left margin of 20, and a right margin of 20. So that way it just ensures that this purple group doesn't touch any of my existing elements within my overall white group here. 
Now below this, this is where we can start to build out the actual CRM itself. So this is where we're going to display a list of customer information. And of course, whenever we're displaying a list of items, we're gonna to need to add in a repeating group. So if I scroll on down to my containers menu, we're gonna add a repeating group element onto our page. And of course, repeating groups allow you to pull and display a list of information from your database. And in this case, we're gonna be displaying a list of customers. So the first thing I'll need to do for this repeating group is jump over to my appearance tab here. And we're gonna to need to configure a data source. So that way Bubble knows what type of information I want to display in this list. And in this case, I'd like to display a list of customers. And of course, that's gonna be linked to our customer data type. Then once we've determined that we wanna display a list of customers, we're gonna to need to set a data source for this repeating group. So that way Bubble knows which specific customers in our database we need to show to this user. So for the data source, I'm gonna perform a search in our database for all of the customers where the company that they belong to. So in a moment, I'm gonna show you how we can actually create a new customer in our database. And when we walk through that process, we're actually gonna link a customer to a company. So let's say you were logged into our company's Salesforce account and you create a new customer because you're talking to someone who's interested in a product you're selling. When you go to create that customer in our database, I would like to link that customer to our company. So that way, when you go to view your CRM, you'll only see customers related to your company, not customers related to anyone else's company. And so what I'm gonna do is reference the field here, which is known as the created company. So this is the company who has created this customer. And again, later on, when we actually build out the workflow to create a new customer in our database, I'm gonna explain this in more detail. But for the time being, what I'd like to do is just reference that I want to display only the customers where the created company equals the same value as the company that the person who's logged in belongs to. So if you were logged into your account, you obviously only wanna see the customers related to your company. So I'm just gonna reference the current user, the company that they work for. I can then choose to close my data source here. And the next thing I'll need to configure before we touch our layout settings is just the number of rows. So at this point in time, this repeating group has a fixed number of rows at four. So it's only going to display four customers. Whereas what I'd like to do is have this repeating group either expand or contract based on how many customers it needs to display. So if it needs to display only one customer, I only want there to be one row. Whereas if it needs to display 100, I want this to expand out and display all of the 100. And so in order to do that, I'm gonna to need to unselect that this should be a fixed number of rows. I will, however, keep the number of columns fixed at one because I only want to display one customer per line. What I will need to do though is also jump over to my layout tab because I'm gonna to need to update the container layout for this repeating group. Now, without trying to confuse you straight away, I am gonna add a group into this repeating group. So it doesn't really matter if I select a row or a column. I am just gonna select the row option for now though. So if you're following along, I'd also recommend selecting that. I'm then gonna to need to unselect that my repeating group should be a fixed width. And of course, I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So that way it can take up as little or as much space as it needs within our overall white group. And then finally, we can start to display all of the information we want inside of this repeating group for each individual customer. Now, as I'd mentioned, I'd like to actually add a group into our repeating group before I display any customer information. And the reason I'd like to do that is because if I jump over to my separate browser once again and run a preview of my existing application that I'd just shown you before, what you'll notice is that when we're viewing our customer data here, if we were to hover over a individual's details, you can see that the background becomes highlighted. So that way I easily know who I'm gonna be selecting at any given point in time. And in order to create that experience, we're gonna to need to add a group element into our repeating group. And then inside of that group, we can add in all of the customer's details. So if we just jump back into our main bubble editor here, we're gonna scroll on down to our containers menu and we're gonna to choose to add a group into our repeating group. Now, once I've added this group in, the first thing I'm gonna do is update the name of this. I'm gonna call this group customer because this is where we're displaying our customer's details. Before I update the container layout, I'm also gonna jump over to my appearance tab and I'm just going to remove the default style of this group and I'm gonna give it a flat background color. I'm gonna leave this at white, but if you did want to just be able to see where this group sits inside of your repeating group, you can always update this to be a custom color. In fact, throughout this tutorial, I might actually just make this a light shade of red so that way you can easily follow along. 
But when I do go to preview my application, I'm just gonna set the background style to be none. So that way it removes that color. But for now, what I'd like to do is just leave that as a shade of red. I'll then jump over into my layout tab here because I'll need to update the container layout of this group. And when it comes to this group, I'm gonna set the container layout to be a row because similar to the group above, I'm gonna to want to stack the customer's data horizontally within this group. I can then jump on down to my width settings and I will unselect that this group should be a fixed width. I will of course set the minimum width as zero and leave the maximum width as infinite. So that way this group is gonna take up as little or as much space as it can within my repeating group cell. And now I will come back in a moment and also update the height. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is actually now display our customer's details. And in order to display a customer's details in our red group, we're gonna scroll on up to our visual elements and we're gonna add a text element into the group itself. Now, one thing I should just point out is that in order to display a customer's details here, if I was to start inserting dynamic data, you'll see that I'm unable to actually reference the information stored in our repeating group cell. And the reason for that is because this text element itself doesn't actually sit directly within our repeating group. Instead, it sits within our red group that then sits within our repeating group. So in order to pull the data from the current cells customer in our repeating group, what I'm gonna need to do is actually pass some data along the chain of elements here. So from our overall repeating group, I'd like to pass the data of the current cells customer into our red group. So if I just quickly sidetrack here and click on my red group, I'm gonna select that I'll need to store a type of content into this group. And the type of content will of course be our customer. Then for the data source, I'd like to pull the data from the current cells customer. So that is the customer within each individual cell of our repeating group. Then from here, if I was to click back into my text element, you'll see that I can now reference the parent group's customer. And so because this text element sits within our red group, the red group is kind of taking care of it. So you can think of the red group as the parent to this text element, which is why it is referenced as the parent group. And because we're storing the value of a customer inside of it, I can easily reference any data I would like from that customer. And in this instance, I'd like to reference the customer's contact name because that's going to sit directly below our relevant heading here. Then when it comes to the layout of this text element, I'm just gonna open up our layout tab. And what I'll need to do is unselect that this should be a fixed width. Like always with any text element, I'll be setting the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it takes up as little or as much space as it possibly can within this group. I'm also gonna set the minimum height to be zero and that way it will collapse around this text nicely. Then while I'm here, I'm also going to vertically align this text element in the center of my red group before I then go ahead and add in 10 pixels of margin at the top and 10 pixels of margin on the bottom. And that is all of the margin settings I'll need to update for this particular text element. In order to display all of the remaining information similar to our headings above, I'm just gonna make a copy of this text element within our red group. Then all I'll need to change in our appearance tab is the data field I'd like to reference. So in this case, instead of displaying the parent group's customer, their name, I'd like to display the name of the company that they work for. Then I'll make yet another copy of this text element. And in this case, I'd like to display the phone number of this person. So this is going to be their contact number. It's nice and straightforward. I'll just move this property editor out of the way for now though. I'm gonna make another copy of that text element. And in this case, I'll be displaying the contact email. It's nice and straightforward. Once again, I will make another copy here. And for this text element, I'm going to display the customer stage. So this is going to be where they are within the deal life cycle. And because this field is linked to an option set, so if I just jump over into my data tab here, and if I was to open up our customer data type, what you'll see is that under our customer stage here, this is of course linked to our customer stage option set list. So within our option sets, we had the customer stage, and this included some options like needs analysis, qualified, follow up, and then closed. And so because that text element on our page is referencing our option sets, we'll just need to choose to display the display text of that option set. So I'm just gonna select the current stage, it's display text. 
And then finally, I'm gonna make one last copy of this text field here. And in this case, I'd like to display the owner of this account. And so in order to do that, I'm just going to display the parent group's customer, the account owner, and that's going to link to a user, which then means I'm gonna to need to select that I want to display the user's name nice and straightforward. And that is how we can display all of the information for a particular customer in our database. But one thing I have noticed here is that all of my text elements are currently touching side by side. And so that just means that if these text elements were quite long, they're just going to be touching in our overall CRM dashboard. And so to avoid that from happening, what I'm actually going to do is select on my second text element here. I'm going to jump to my layout tab and I'm just gonna add in 10 pixels of margin on the left. Then I'm gonna do the exact same thing for my third text element. I'll add 10 pixels of margin on its left. I'll do the same thing for my fourth, as well as my fifth element. I'm gonna add in 10 pixels of margin on the left there. And then finally, I can do the exact same thing for my last element there. So it will also have 10 pixels of margin. Now, because I want these text elements to sit directly below the relevant title above, I'm also gonna need to reflect the exact same margins I added to the left-hand side of each text element to the relevant heading above. So if I select on my company heading here, I'm going to jump to my layout tab and I'm just gonna add in 10 pixels margin to its left. I'll then do the exact same thing for my mobile heading, my email heading, my deal stage heading, as well as my owner heading. And that's just going to ensure that when this page reduces in size, these headings aren't gonna to be touching directly as well. But that's all I wanna change on my headings there. After I finished adding in all of the information I want to display inside of our red group, I can now choose to collapse the overall height of this group. So I'm gonna select on my red group, open up my layout tab, and within our layout tab, I'm just going to, first of all, remove the minimum width of this group. I'm gonna set that to be zero. Of course, leaving the maximum width is infinite. I will also update the minimum height to be zero here, which now you'll see it will collapse nicely around all of the text elements inside of it there. And when it comes to this group, I'm not gonna to need to add any margin in this group specifically. Instead, I'm gonna add that onto our repeating group in a moment, but there is one last thing I'll need to add to this group, and that is just a condition that allows us to create that feature that changes the background color of the group whenever we hover over it. So you may remember in my example before when I'd shown you a preview of our CRM, when we had hovered over a particular user, it just changed the color of the background, so I kind of highlighted it. Now, thankfully, that is a relatively easy experience to create. All we'll need to do is select our red group, jump over to our conditional tab here, and we can just choose to define a condition that recognizes when this group is hovered. So that means when a user is hovering over it with their mouse. And in this case, the behavior I'd like to change is just going to be the background color of this group. So I'm just gonna type in the word color, and I'll update the background color. And instead of this being the shade of red, I'm gonna set this to just be a shade of gray. If you'd like that color code, it's F8, F8, F8. And of course, when I go to preview my application in a moment, I'm gonna remove that red background color. But if you really wanted to see what this condition's gonna look like, what I love about Bubble is that you can select this option here to toggle this on and off. So you can see that this is going to be the shade of gray that's going to display whenever this condition is true. Now that's actually everything I wanted to change for that group. The last thing we'll need to do on this page is select the overall repeating group here. We'll then need to jump into our layout tab. And it's at this point that we can update the minimum height of this repeating group to be zero which means that it's going to collapse nicely around our very first cell. Now, of course, just because you only see one cell in our repeating group doesn't mean that it is only going to display one customer. In fact, this repeating group's going to continually expand out and display as many customers as it needs to for that company. Now, while I'm in my layout tab for our repeating group, I'd also just like to add in 20 pixels of margin at the bottom, 20 on the left and 20 on the right and that's going to ensure it aligns nicely with our existing purple group above it. But finally, the very, very last thing I'll need to do for this repeating group is head over to my appearance tab and just update the minimum height of each row. So although in our layout tab here, we've updated the minimum height of the overall repeating group element, so that is what you see here around all of the borders of our repeating group. I'm also gonna need to update the height of each row inside of that repeating group. And in this case, it's nice and easy. I'm just gonna set that to be zero. So that way it collapses nicely around the red group inside of it there. 
And just like that, that is how we can display all of our customer information within our own custom CRM. The very last thing we'll need to do from here is just select on our overall white group. So we're kind of having a full circle moment. We're finally coming back to the main group we've added onto this page. And at this point, I just want to add some margins around this group. So we're going to jump to our layout tab. And for the margins on this group, I'm just going to add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. I'm also going to update the minimum height to now be zero. And because we have this option selected by default to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, what you'll see is that it's going to collapse nicely around the repeating group inside of it. So if I just close this property editor, you can finally see that our page has started to come together quite nicely. Now, unfortunately, at this point, if I was to run a preview of this page, it'd actually be quite pointless. You wouldn't see any data. And that is because we haven't yet created the feature to add a new customer into our CRM. That definitely is coming up within our tutorial, but I'm not going to run a preview of this now because if you were to look at this page, unfortunately, there just wouldn't be any customer data to show you within our CRM. What I am going to do though, is just jump back into my Notion checklist and finally tick off that we finished building out the feature to display a list of customers within our CRM. And moving forward within the next few modules in our course here, we're really going to start to make this CRM quite powerful by layering on some additional features. Working our way through the list of features in our checklist today, the next thing I want to cover is how we can build out the feature to create a new customer within our CRM. And thankfully, this is a relatively straightforward process to work through. So what we're going to do is we're just going to jump right into our bubble editor and open up our existing CRM page. So this is the page that's going to display all of the customer details that belong to a particular company. And you may remember that on this page, we had added a button in the top right hand corner that just displays the word new. Today, with the experience I want to create, I want to display a pop-up whenever this button is clicked. And on that pop-up, we're going to have a series of input fields, which will allow someone to add in all of the details of a customer. And then of course, once they choose to create that customer, it's going to run a workflow and it's going to create a new entry in our database. So the first thing we'll need to do is add a pop-up element onto our page. So if we scroll on down to our containers menu, we're going to add a pop-up. You can add it anywhere on the page because it's actually going to display over the top of your page. Now, when I'm working with pop-ups, the very first thing I traditionally do is just update the title of these, just so that way, whenever I need to reference the pop-up, I know exactly which element it is within my overall elements tree. So I'm going to update the name of this to be called pop-up create customer. Then from here, we're going to jump to our layout tab and we're going to set a container layout for this pop-up because of course, pop-ups are like a group that displays over the top of your page. So as you can see here, it adds a layer of opacity across the rest of your page. So that way the user's focus is on the pop-up element itself. Now, because this acts like a group, what we're going to need to do is set a container layout. And when it comes to this pop-up, I'm going to be stacking elements in this from top to bottom. So that means I'm going to set the container layout as a column because that will allow me to stack elements vertically. While we're here, I'm also just going to update the width of this pop-up. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm then going to set the minimum width here to be zero. But when it comes to the maximum width, I'm going to leave this as 600 pixels. And the reason for that is because if I was to leave that as an infinite max width, as you just saw, it's going to take up the entire width of our page. And that's not the experience I want to create. And the reason why I've selected 600 pixels is purely just a personal preference of mine. There's no scientific approach behind it. But with a minimum width of zero, that just means that this group is going to be fully responsive as it's going to continually expand down as our page shrinks in size. Now I will come back later on and update the height of this particular pop-up. But before I do that, I'm going to need to add in all of the elements I'd like to display inside of this pop-up. And the very first element I'd like to add into my pop-up is just going to be a heading at the top in the center. So if I head to my visual elements, I'm going to add a text element into our pop-up. And this is just going to display the words new customer. Now I'd like to customize the style of this particular text. So I'm going to remove the style here. I'm going to set the font size to be 18. I'm also going to align this text in the center. And then finally, I'm going to choose to bold this text. Now from here, I'll also need to update the responsive settings of this text element. So in order to do that, I'm going to jump to my layout tab. 
And of course, when I'm working with any text element, I will unselect that it should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it will take up as little or as much space as it possibly can on my page. I'll also set the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this option selected here to fit the height of the element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse nicely around that text. But finally, the last thing I'd like to change within my layout tab is just the margin around this text. I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 pixels on the left and 20 pixels on the right. And that of course is just going to ensure that this text element doesn't touch the borders of my pop-up. Now below this text element, I actually want to display another text element. And in order to streamline that whole process, I'm just going to make a copy of our first heading, select on my pop-up and paste in another version of this. And now for this text element, I'm gonna to jump to my appearance tab and I'm gonna have this display the words company contact name. And the reason for that is because below this text element, I'm gonna to start to add in the series of input fields, which will allow a user of our Salesforce application to add in the details of a customer or a lead. So this is just going to indicate what information someone will need to add into what field. When it comes to this text element, I'm gonna update the font size to be 14. So I'm just gonna shrink this down a bit. I'm also going to align this to the left so that way it's no longer in the center. Then below this, I can add in an input field where of course someone can add in the contact name of the person they're speaking to at a company. So I'm gonna scroll on down to my input forms and I'm gonna add a standard input field into my pop-up. And the first thing I'll need to do is just update the name of this input field. So that way when I build out my workflow in a moment to create a new customer, I know what data to reference on my page. And for the name of this input field, I'm gonna call this input new customer name. And that's all I'll need to change here for now. I'll also jump into my layout tab. And of course, I'm gonna make this element fully responsive, which means that I'm gonna to need to unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. I am gonna keep the height fixed at 48 pixels though. I won't need to change that. But the other thing I'll need to do is just add in a left margin of 20 and a right margin of 20. Now below this, I'm gonna continue adding in a series of input fields. And in order to save time having to build those from scratch, I'm just gonna make a copy of my existing heading and my input field here. So I'm gonna select both of these, click back into my pop-up and paste in another version. I'll then move my heading down here. I'll then jump to the appearance tab of my text element and I'm gonna have this display the words company name. So this is where a user can store the actual name of a company itself. And perhaps to help differentiate between these two input fields, I might actually just update the text in our first heading. I'm gonna have this display the word customer contact name instead of company contact name. A user might just get confused between the two. But of course, what I'll also need to do is just select on my new input field and I'll need to update the name of this. And I'm gonna call this input new customer company name. So now I can clearly interpret that this is where we're gonna store the actual company name itself. Then from here, I'm gonna add in another input field. So I'm going to select both my text element and my input field once again. I'll make a copy of those. I will, similar to before, move my text heading down and I'm gonna update this text to display the words customer email. And as you probably guessed, this is where we're going to store the email address for a customer or a lead. So I'm also gonna to need to select on the input element itself. And I'm gonna update the title of this to be called new customer email. And now contrary to what you might think, I'm not gonna set the content format here to be an email. Instead, I'm just gonna leave this as a text field. And the reason for that is because you only need to store this as an email field when you're creating a new account. Because in that case, you'll need to make sure it is a valid email address. Whereas I'm actually gonna be storing this data as text in my database. So I can just leave that as the text option. Then from here, I'm gonna do the exact same thing once again. So I'm going to select both my heading and my input field. I will select on my pop-up, paste in another version of this. I'll drag my heading down and this is going to display the words customer number. I'll then select on my new input field. I will update the title of this to be called input new customer number. And once again, I will leave the content format as text. I'm not gonna update this to be a number or an integer. I'm just gonna keep this as it is. Then from here, we're gonna make another copy of this input field and the heading. So I'm just going to copy those, select my pop-up, paste in a new version. I'll then drag my heading down once again. And I'm gonna update this to display the words deal size. 
Now, when it comes to this input field, the first thing I'm gonna do is update the title, of course. I'm gonna call this new customer deal size. But when it comes to the content format of this field, I am actually gonna update this. I'm gonna set this to be a currency and I'm gonna leave the currency prefix as dollars just because I'm currently based in a country where we use dollars. But by setting this to a currency, that's going to format this as a number, which if you remember in our database, we were storing the deal size as a number field. And the reason we were doing that is because when you're storing numbers, you can actually perform calculations. So later on, when we build out our sales dashboard, I'll be able to calculate how much is in our sales pipeline. And to do that, I can just add up all of the customer deal size values together. But that's all I'll need to change for this. Moving down our list, I'm gonna need to add in another input field. Only this time, instead of adding in a standard input field, I'm gonna use a drop down menu. I am still gonna need to just make a copy of my heading element here. So I'm gonna select on my deal size, make a copy of that, click on my pop-up and choose to paste in a new version of this. I'll move that down on the actual pop-up itself. And for this text, I'm gonna update the title here to be called status. So that way this is where someone can add in the status of this customer. Now, if I scroll on down to my input forms, I'm gonna choose to add in a drop down menu for this field. And first of all, I'll be updating the title of this to be called drop down new customer status. And for this drop down menu, I'd like to reference the list of option sets we had previously created in our database. So if we were to just quickly sidetrack and jump over to our data tab here, what we can do is open up our option sets. And you may remember that we had this option set list called customer status. So this just determines if a customer is a lead, an actual customer, or if they've actually expired. And so what I wanna do is reference these three options within that drop down menu. And I can easily do that by just jumping back into my design tab. And for the type of choices that I want to display in this drop down menu, I'm just going to display a list of dynamic choices, which means I'm going to reference a list of choices that already exist in my database. And of course they are my option sets. So for the type of choices, I'm just gonna reference my customer status option set. Then from here, I'd like to reference all of the options inside of that list. So I'm gonna select the all customer status. And in terms of the text that's going to display, I'd like this to just be the current options display text. So that's now just going to display the actual name of each customer status. Finally, I can then jump over to my layout tab because I'll need to update the responsive settings of this input field. Before I do that though, I'm just gonna move this to the next position within my overall pop-up. So that way it sits below the relevant heading. I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. Of course, I'm also then going to set the minimum width to zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. For the height, I'm happy to leave that as a fixed value at 48 pixels but I'll also just need to add in 20 pixels of margin on the left and 20 pixels of margin on the right. So that way this drop down menu fits in line with all of my existing input fields that sit above it there. And now below this drop down menu, there is just one last input field I'd like to add onto my pop-up and it is also going to be a drop down menu. So to streamline that whole process, I'm gonna select both my heading and my drop down menu here. I'm gonna make a copy of those. I'll then select on my pop-up and paste in a new version of those. I'll move my heading down here. And I'm gonna update the text here to display the words deal stage. And at this point in time within my drop down menu, I'd like to reference my separate option set list, which was known as my deal stage. So if I jump over to my database once again, you'll remember that we have this customer stage option set list. So this just determines at what point in the sales life cycle this customer is in. So do they need some additional scoping? Are they a qualified lead? Do we need to follow up with them or are they closed? And so of course, in order to reference this option set list, I'm going to update the type of choices I'm going to display for this drop down menu. I'm gonna have this be my customer stage option set list. When it comes to the options I'd like to display from this list, it's gonna be all the customer stages. And then finally, I'll just set the caption to be the current options display. It's as simple as that. And that is all of the input fields I'll need to add onto this pop-up. The very last thing I'd like to include is just a button which when clicked is going to trigger a workflow to create a new customer in our database. So if I scroll on up to our visual elements, I'm gonna add in a button into my pop-up and I'm gonna have this button display the words create customer. I'll then jump to my layout tab. 
because I'd like to move this button to the last position within my pop-up. I'm then going to also unselect that this should be a fixed width. And for this button, I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, but I'm gonna leave the maximum width as 200 pixels. And so that just means that this button will reduce in size. However, it will never be larger than 200 pixels in width, which is enough to fit both of my words inside of it. When it comes to the height though, I am going to leave that at 45 pixels. I'm quite happy with that. I would also like to horizontally align this button in the center of my pop-up before I then add in 20 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the bottom, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that concludes everything I'd like to add into this pop-up. So from here, what I'm gonna to need to do is actually click on my pop-up, head to my layout tab. And it's at this point that I can now set the minimum height to zero. And because we have this option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of my elements that sit directly within it. And that is everything we'll need to configure for this pop-up. Of course, what I'd now like to do is create a workflow that's going to run whenever this create customer button is clicked. And when that workflow runs, I'd like to create a new entry in our database. Before I do that though, I'm gonna to need to create an additional workflow that actually displays this pop-up on our page. So if I just click away from this pop-up here, one thing I should point out is that by default, pop-ups are not visible on your page. They'll only be displayed whenever you call them within a workflow. So in order to show that pop-up, I'm gonna to need to click my new button here. I'll open up our property editor and I'm gonna to choose to start a workflow whenever this button is clicked. And thankfully this is a super straightforward process. All I'm gonna do is head to my element actions and I'm gonna to choose to show an element. And that element is of course my pop-up create customer. Now, because this workflow is related to the feature that allows us to create a customer in our database, what I'm gonna do is click on my workflow trigger and I'm gonna update the event color here to be blue. So that way later on on this page, if I ever need to adjust any workflow related to this specific feature, I know that that workflow color is blue. So that way I can easily interpret which workflows I need to work with. Then after building this workflow, we can now go on to build out the main workflow which creates a customer in our database. So we're gonna to jump to our design tab here. We're gonna to need to show our pop-up once again. So in order to do that, we're gonna to head to our elements tree. We're going to select on our pop-up create customer and that's now going to display this pop-up. I'll then select on the create customer button and choose to start a workflow whenever this is clicked. And within this workflow, I'd like to add in a couple of different steps. The first thing I'd like to do is of course, create a new customer in our database. So I'm gonna to choose to add in an action and I'm gonna select from the data events. And in this case, I'd like to create a brand new thing. The type of thing I'd like to create is of course going to be a customer. And then from here, I'll need to match all of the relevant data fields in our database with the relevant input fields on our pop-up. So to streamline the process of adding all of those in, I'm just gonna tick this option to add in all of the necessary fields here. And now of course, I'll just need to match these with the relevant fields on our page. So for the very first field I'll need to customize, this is going to be the account owner. So this is the person who is responsible for this customer. And in this case, this is going to be the person who's creating this customer at this point in time. And so that is nice and easy. It's just going to be the person who is the current user. So that is the person who is logged in and is creating this new customer. Now for the next field, this is known as the closed date. And of course, if we're adding a customer as a new lead into our database, this field might not actually be relevant at this point in time. So I'm personally just going to delete this. Later on, I will show you though how we can update the close date of a customer. So that way we can easily reference it within our sales dashboard. The next field though is the name of the company that this person works for. So this is the company that we're gonna be storing on this customer account. And so this company itself is just going to be the value of our input company name. So this is our input new customer company name here. It's value, nice and easy. For the contact email of this customer, I'm just gonna type in the word email and then I'll be able to reference the relevant input field. So our input new customer email. I'll then do the exact same thing for our contact name. So this is the name of our contact for this customer account. This is just going to be the input new customer name. I'll select its value. For the number, I'm just gonna type in the word number here and I can reference the relevant input field. For the created company, so this is where I'm gonna link the customer back to the company that's actually managing this account. I'm gonna have this be the current user, so once again, the person who is logged in creating this customer, their company. So that is the company that they work for. Then for the customer stage, I'm just going to type in the word drop down and I'll be able to reference the drop down. Now, what I can see here is that I had forgotten to 
update the title of that drop down menu. And so what I'm actually gonna do is just jump back into my design tab and update that now, just so that way I can follow best practice when I'm creating this workflow. So if I jump into my design tab here, I'm going to select on my deal stage drop down menu. And if I head up to the title, I'm gonna update this to be called new customer stage. I'll then jump back into my workflow editor. And for the customer stage, if I just type in drop down, I'll now be able to select the drop down new customer stage, its value. Then for our customer status, this is also going to be a drop down menu. This will be our drop down new customer status, its value. And then finally for our deal size, I'm just gonna type in the word deal and I'm gonna reference the input new customer deal size, its value there. And now at this point in time, this workflow would have run and it would create a brand new customer inside of our database. But right now, if we jump back to our design tab, this pop-up would still be displayed on our page. Whereas what I actually want to do is create an experience that closes this pop-up and resets all of the values of this input field. So that way, if I was to add in a customer's details, I would then close this pop-up. And if I was to open this pop-up once again, I want all of these values of our input fields to be blank. So that way I can just jump right ahead and add in another customer. I don't wanna to have to remove all of the existing details of the last customer that I've just created. And so in order to create this experience, I'm gonna do two additional things in my workflow. The first thing I'm gonna do is hide our pop-up. So if I add an additional step into my workflow here, I'm gonna to head to our element actions and I'm gonna to choose to hide an element. That element will of course be our pop-up create customer. And then finally, I'm gonna to choose to reset the input fields on our pop-up. So if I add an additional step again, I'm just gonna type in the word reset, and I'm gonna select this option to reset relevant inputs. Then finally, in this workflow, I'm gonna click on the workflow trigger itself and just update the event color here to be blue, so that way I can tell that these two workflows are related to the same feature of creating a new customer account. And thankfully, at this point in time, that is everything we'll need to build out when it comes to bringing this feature to life. What I'd now love to do is just log into my account and show you how this is going to function when it comes to creating a new customer in our database. And of course, once we create a new customer, all of their information will be displayed within our own CRM. Over in a preview of my CRM page, I'm logged in as the existing account that I've created. Now, if I'd like to add a new customer, I'm gonna head up to our button here. I'll click this and our pop-up will display. And of course, you'll see that we have the ability to add in all of the information into our relevant input fields. So I'm just gonna quickly jump ahead and I'm gonna add in all of the details here. And after I jumped ahead and added in all of this customer's details, what I'm gonna do is select to create this new customer. And that workflow is going to run and it's not only going to create a new customer in my database, but of course, it's also going to hide my pop-up. And what you'll now see is that that customer's details are being displayed within our overall CRM. And of course, if I was to hover on their details, it's going to highlight this row within our overall database. Jumping back into my Notion checklist, I'm going to tick off that we've finished building out the feature to create a new customer. And thankfully, this wasn't anything too difficult that we couldn't handle. And it's at this point that you can really start to see our Salesforce clone come together quite nicely. Moving down through our list of features in my Notion checklist, the next thing I wanna cover is how we can build a filter for our custom CRM. And thankfully, there's not too much involved in this process, but of course, I'm gonna be sure to explain everything you need to know in as much detail as I possibly can. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump over into our bubble editor here, and we're gonna open up our existing CRM page. So this is the page that's going to display a list of all of the customers within a company account. Now you may remember that in the top right hand corner, we created this little custom button using a group. And this button will be used to display our own custom filters today. So when someone clicks on this button, I'd like to display almost like a group that sits over the top of my page. And inside of that, I'm going to allow someone to filter through a list of all of their customers by either the customer's name, the customer's status, or even the customer's deal stage. And so in order to actually design that experience, as I mentioned, we're gonna use something like a group element, only we're gonna run into a problem if we were to add a regular group onto our page. So if I was to add a standard group element below our filter button here, what you'll see is that it's going to push our main group down on the page. 
Whereas in the experience I'd like to create today, I actually want this group to hover over the top of any elements on my page. So I'm just gonna quickly delete this group here. And instead of using a standard group, I'm gonna use what's known as a focus group. So this is called the group focus inside of your containers menu here. The first thing you'll notice is that it's automatically positioned in the top left-hand corner. And that's because as the name would suggest, a focus group actually is pinned and focused to one element on your page. So focus groups are perfect for creating drop-down menus that hover over the top of any other element. So within the configurations here, you'll see that we have the ability to update what's known as the reference element. And in this case, I'd like to pin this focus group to my filter button. So for the reference element, I'm just gonna type in the word filter. And I'm going to pin this to my group filter button. And now you'll see that my focus group will automatically sit directly below that button, regardless of where that button is on my page. So as the page decreases in size and the filter button moves in towards the left, this focus group will follow the exact same position as the filter button itself. And another thing you'll notice is that this focus group actually hovers over the top of any other element on our page. So it truly just creates a nice drop down menu experience. And when it comes to updating the additional settings for this focus group, before I make any changes, the first thing I'd like to do is actually just update the title of this. I'm gonna call this group focus filter menu. So that way, if I ever need to build a workflow to display this group, I know exactly which group to reference. Then if I was to move down into our appearance tab, you'll also notice we have these options to set the offset of this group. So the offset just refers to this group's position on our page. So right now you can see that this focus group is pinned directly to our filter button. So if I was to just add in an offset of 10 pixels at the top, it's just gonna add a little bit of spacing, which is purely just a personal preference of mine. And then below this, you'll also see the option to offset this to the left. And now if I was to add in a positive number, so something like 100 pixels, you'll see that this is going to add in 100 pixels of almost like margin on the left-hand side of this focus group. And it's actually gonna push this in the wrong direction I want. So it's currently pushing it to the right-hand side of my app, whereas I'd actually like to position this further to the left-hand side. And so a great little trick if you're using a focus group is that you can add in almost like a negative margin so a negative left offset. So if I was to set this offset to be something like minus 500, what you'll now see is that our focus group will be positioned further to the left of our page. And of course, this is still technically going to be pinned to our filter button. So whenever that filter button moves, this focus group will also move. And now the reason why I've set the offset as 500 pixels today is because I'm just gonna need to expand the overall width of this focus group to fit in all of my elements inside of it. So in a moment, we're gonna jump to our layout tab and we're just gonna update the width settings of this. But before I do that, I'd just like to quickly remove the default style of this focus group. Just while we're working with this element, I'm gonna set this to have a solid background color of something like a light shade of yellow. And of course, this is purely just a personal preference of mine. Whenever I'm working with groups, I just like to color code them so that way I can see where they are on the page. We're then gonna jump to our layout tab here. And because this focus group is technically a group, as the name would suggest, we're gonna need to set a container layout inside of this group. Now, when it comes to this group, I'm going to display three input elements directly side by side. So they're gonna be positioned horizontally within this group. And of course, when we're displaying elements horizontally, we'll need to set the container layout to be a row. When it comes to the width, I'm then going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm going to set the minimum width as zero. And for the time being, I am gonna leave the maximum width as infinite, but I will come back and show you how we can update this in a moment. I'll also do the exact same thing for my height. I'm just gonna leave that as it is. Now for the elements inside of this focus group, as I mentioned, I'm gonna add in three input fields. The first one is going to be a text input field, which will allow us to filter a list of customers by a company's name. Then beside that, I'm gonna add in two drop-down menus, which is going to allow us to filter customers by things like their deal status and their deal stage. So I'm just gonna jump down to my input forms here and I'm gonna add in a standard input field. And before I make any changes to this input field, the first thing I'd like to do is update the title of this. So I'm gonna select on this title and I'm actually gonna call this filter account name. So this is of course, as I just mentioned, the input that will allow us to filter customers by the company's name. And when it comes to the settings I'd like to update for this input field, 
I'm just gonna quickly take the time to update what's known as the placeholder text. So you'll see that by default, every input field has this placeholder text that displays the words type here. So unlike initial content, placeholder text just temporarily displays some text until a user actually clicks into that input field. And then it automatically removes that text and allows someone to type something into it, which is actually quite the opposite to something like initial content, which allows someone to actually select the text and make changes to it. So our placeholder text is, as the name would suggest, just a placeholder. And in this case, I'm just gonna update this to display the words account name. So that way a user knows that this is where they should type in the name of a company. I'm then gonna choose to jump over to my layout tab because I'd now like to update the responsive settings for this input field. The first thing I'm going to do is unselect that this element should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, but I would like to add a maximum width here of 200 pixels. So that just means that with a minimum width of zero, this input field will reduce to the smallest possible size, but at its largest size, it will be no greater than 200 pixels. I'm also just going to keep the height settings as they are. So I'm gonna keep that fixed at 48 pixels. I will also then vertically align this element in the center of my focus group. And then finally add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom and 10 on the left. And of course, that's just going to ensure that it won't touch any borders of the focus group itself. Now, beside this, I'd like to add in another input field, and that's going to be a drop down menu. So, if we head to our input forms, I'm going to grab a drop down menu. I will add this in here. And when it comes to this drop down menu, I'm going to allow someone to select how they want to filter customers by the status of that customer's account. And so, the first thing I'm going to do is actually just update the name of this. I'm going to call this drop down filter customer status. And within this drop down menu, I'd like to display our list of option sets in our database, which are based off our customer status. So if I was to jump over into my data tab here and open up my option sets, you may remember that we had created this option set list, which is known as our customer status. So this will just determine if the customer is a lead, an existing customer, or if they've expired. And so in order to display these three options within this drop down menu, what I'd like to do is update the choices style of this. And I'm gonna have this reference a list of dynamic choices. So that just means it's going to pull a list of options from our database. And for the type of choices, I of course want this to be my customer status option set. For the options I'd like to display within this list, it's gonna be all of my customer status option sets. So that's every single option in that list. And then finally for the actual caption, which is just the text that's going to display inside of this drop down menu, I'm gonna have this be my option sets display text, which is just the name of each option. I'll then jump over into my layout tab because once again, I'll need to make this element fully responsive. I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will then set the minimum width to zero. Only in this case, I'm gonna set the maximum width to be 150 just because I won't need as much space for this particular input field. For the height though, I'm gonna keep that fixed at 48 pixels. I'll also vertically align this in the center of my focus group, and then finally add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 10 on the bottom, and 10 on the left. I can also see that I haven't taken the time to update the placeholder text. So at this point in time, a user wouldn't know what this filter will do. So we just need to jump back to our appearance tab here, and we're gonna update the placeholder text to display the words, customer status, and that's all we'll need to change there. And then finally, I'm gonna add in one last drop down menu, only in this case, it's going to allow someone to filter through accounts by the deal stage. And in order to streamline that process, I'm actually gonna make a copy of my existing drop down menu here. So I'm gonna select this element, I'll make a copy, I'll then click in my yellow focus group and paste in a version of that. And the first thing I'll do is just update the title of this input field. I'm gonna call this drop down filter customer stage, not status. I'm also gonna update the placeholder text to display the words customer stage instead of customer status once again. And then finally, when it comes to the list of options I'd like to display within this drop down menu, instead of displaying my customer status, I'm going to display my list of customer stage option sets. I'm also then just gonna to need to update the choices source. So I'm gonna reference all of the options within my customer stage option set list, and I can keep the caption as it is. It's just going to display the display text for each option set. Now, the only thing I'll need to change within my layout tab here is that I just like to add a right margin of 10 pixels 
just because this is going to be the very last element that sits inside of this focus group. So I don't want its right border touching the actual border of the group itself. But that concludes everything I'd like to add into this focus group. So now what I'm gonna need to do is select on the focus group and update its layout settings. So that way we can have this wrap nicely around all of my input fields inside of it. So first of all, when it comes to the height here, I'm gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And because we have this option selected to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse nicely around all of our input fields. But of course, at this point in time, we have all of this empty space on it, the right hand side. And the reason for that is because we have a maximum width of infinite for this focus group. So it's trying to take up as much space as it possibly can on our page. Whereas in fact, all we really need is enough width to fit all of these three elements inside of it. So in order to find out the exact number of pixels I need for my maximum width, what I can do is just some basic maths. So if I was to select on my very first input field here, I can see that its maximum width is 200 pixels. So at its largest possible size, it will only ever be 200. If I was to then select on my second drop down menu, I can see that its maximum width is 150. So 200 plus 150 is 350. We also then have a third drop down menu with a maximum width of 150. And so if we were to add another 150 pixels onto the existing two elements, that's going to equal 500 pixels in total. But another thing we'll need to factor in is the margin we've added horizontally across this group. So on our very first element, we've got 10 pixels of margin on the left. For our second element, we've got 10 pixels of margin on the left as well. So we're gonna to need to add an additional 20 pixels so far. So that's 520 pixels. But for our very last element, we have two margins. So there's two margins with 10 pixels each. So we're gonna to need to add yet another 20 pixels to the total. So the grand total right now is 540 pixels in maximum width. So if I was to select on my yellow focus group here, I could set its maximum width to be 540 pixels. And that's going to collapse perfectly around all of my input fields that sit inside of it. And that is all I will need to do when it comes to the design of this focus group here. One thing I should point out is that by default, a focus group will not be visible on your page. So we're gonna to need to create a workflow to toggle this element on and off. So in order to do that, I'm gonna select on my filter button here. I'm gonna to head to my appearance tab and I'm gonna to choose to start a new workflow whenever this button is clicked. And within this workflow, I'm just gonna type in the word toggle and I'll choose to toggle an element. And that element will of course be my focus group. So I'm just gonna type in the word focus and select my group focus filter menu. It truly is as simple as that. And the very last thing we'll need to do when it comes to creating this filter is build out a way to actually make this filter affect the customers that are displayed within our repeating group on the page. So let's say if someone was to come to this page and it was to load all of their existing customers for their company, I obviously want to have the information selected within this focus group to impact which customers are being displayed. And the way I can do that is by adding some additional constraints on the data source for my main repeating group. So if I was to select on my red group here, so this is my group customer, which just contains all of my customers information. Now we'll just need to remember that this group sits inside of a repeating group. So in order to access that repeating group, I'm going to right click on my red group and select its first parent. And now you'll see we have the ability to access our repeating group. Now what I'd like to do is select my data source here. And you'll see that at this point in time, we only have one constraint on this data source. So it's only displaying a list of customers where the company that they belong to equals the current user's company. So that is the company that someone works for. Whereas what I'd like to do is add an additional series of constraints that just displays customers based on the information of these input fields. So I'm gonna to choose to add a new constraint. And the first constraint I'm going to select is going to be the company name of this customer. So I'm gonna select the company name data field. And what I'd like to do is only display a list of companies where the company name contains the same value as the input account name here. So I'm going to reference that input field. I'm gonna type in the word account and I'll reference our filter account name field, its value. Then I'd also like to filter out all of the customers where the status, so the customer status field, where it equals the same value as the option selected within this drop down menu here. So I'm going to type in the word status and I'm going to select from the drop down filter customer status its value. 
And then finally, I'm also going to add a constraint that just recognizes when the customer stage, when the value of this account equals the same value selected from the customer stage dropdown here. So I'm gonna once again type in the word stage and I'm gonna select the option for our dropdown filter customer stage, its value, it's nice and straightforward. Now, one thing I should point out at this point in time is that when this repeating group now loads, it's only going to load customers that fit all of this criteria. And of course, if our focus group is hidden by default and there's no values within these input fields, Bubble's gonna have a hard time finding customers because there's actually gonna be no customers with blank values for these fields. And so as it stands, this search here would cause a bad user experience because no customers would actually load. And so in order to make this fully functional, what we need to do is simply just select this option here to ignore empty constraints. And that just means that if any of these constraints are empty, Bubble's just going to ignore it as if it does not exist. So if someone hasn't typed in a value into our account name, it's just going to ignore this whole field. And likewise, if someone hasn't selected a value from our dropdown menus, it's also just going to ignore these constraints as well. And so that just means that by default, our top constraint here, where we're only displaying customers that belong to the current user's company, that is going to be the only constraint that loads until someone actually adds a value into these input fields. Now that's actually everything we're gonna to need to build out for our filter here. What I'd love to do is just run a preview of this and show you how it's going to function when I want to sort through all of the customers within my own Salesforce account. Over on a preview of my CRM page here, I've just jumped ahead and I've added in a few customers into my own account. And so let's say I wanted to filter through all of these customers and find a specific person. What I could do is head over to my filter button, open this up here, and I could start typing in the name of an account. So let's say I wanna search for my SpaceX account. You'll see that my contact with Elon Musk is being displayed because we have him in our sales pipeline. If I wanted, I could also just remove that filter and filter customers by their status. So if I wanted to filter out all of my leads, so that way I know who I'm prospecting, I could select that. I could then choose to close my filter and I could look at all of that information. And finally, I could even add a layer onto my filter and filter out all of these people who are qualified, which you can obviously see there's none, or all of the people who need to be followed up with. In which case, you'll just see that the only account I have that meets this criteria is my good old buddy, Bruce Wayne. Jumping back into my Notion checklist, I'm just going to tick off that we've finished building out our own custom filter for our CRM. Now, by all means, today I've just shown you how you can filter through three fields within your customer data type, but you can choose to add in as many different custom filters as you would like, following the exact same process that I've just shown you. Moving down through our list of features I have set up for us in our Notion checklist today, the next thing I'd like to cover is how we can build out a dedicated customer page just to display the full details of a specific customer within our own Salesforce account. So if I was to jump over into my bubble editor and open up our CRM page, you may remember that of course on this page we have the repeating group that's displaying all of the customer details in our database. But as it stands, this repeating group only just displays a quick snap snapshot of some of the most important fields for each customer. It doesn't actually show the salesperson the full information about that account. And of course, also on this page, users are unable to make changes to this customer's account. So they're obviously gonna need a dedicated space in our application where they can update things like the deal stage or even who the point of contact is for that customer account. Now, what we're gonna do today is build out a dedicated page to display all of this information. And then later on, we're also gonna create a feature that allows us to update the details on that page. So we're gonna head over to our page dropdown menu in the top left-hand corner, and we're gonna to choose to add a new page into our application. And I'm gonna call this the customer page. I'll choose to create this from scratch. Then over on this page, there's a few quick things I'm gonna do before I start adding all of my elements onto it. And the very first thing I'm gonna do is just open up my property editor and update the background color for this page. 
So I'm going to update this from the color white through to my color blue that I've had on my previous pages. And if you'd like this color code, once again, it's 009EDB. I'm also just going to update the opacity of this color to be 10%, so that way it's not as bold. I'm also then going to need to jump over to my layout tab, because in this instance, I'll need to set the container layout of my page to be a column. Because of course, like any page, I'm going to be stacking elements from top to bottom. So it's going to be stacked vertically. I'm then going to also just jump back into my appearance tab one more time and the reason for this is because I'd actually like to take the time to set a type of content on this page. So if this page is going to be used to display almost like a profile page for each customer, I'm going to need to create some sort of way to send the data of a specific customer to this page and then of course I'd also like to display the data of that customer on the page. And the way in which you can do this in Bubble is by setting a type of content on your page. So let's say for instance, in my own Salesforce account, I had 100 customers. If I wanted to display the dedicated details of each individual customer, every customer is going to need their own dedicated page. But instead of having to design 100 custom pages, what you can do in Bubble is create what's known as dynamic pages. And by dynamic, that just means that you can send and display data that's stored in your database. So if I was to set a type of content on this page to be a customer, what this allows me to do in Bubble is add in all of my elements I'd like to display for a particular customer. And then if I was to jump back to my home page, I can actually choose to send through the data of a specific customer that I would like to display on this page. And so that's where the idea of a dynamic page comes into play. Essentially, instead of having to build those 100 pages, you would only need to build one customer page and you just need to send the data of whatever customer you'd like to display on that page. So once I've set the type of content to be a customer, I'm actually going to backtrack here and jump back to my CRM page. Now, if my new customer page is able to store the data of a customer on it, I'm going to need to send data to that page of a particular customer. And of course, the customer is going to be the person that is selected from this CRM repeating group. So what I'm going to do is select on this red group here. So this is my group customer that houses all of my customers details. And I'm actually going to choose to start a workflow whenever this group is clicked. So that way, if someone selects the group itself or any of the information within that group, it's going to run this workflow. And within this workflow, I'd like to just add one simple step. I'm going to choose from a navigation event because in this case, I want to send someone through to that new customer page. So I'm going to select the go to page action. The destination page will be my customer page that we've just created. And what you'll now notice is that because we have a type of content stored on that page, Bubble requires us to send a data type to that page. And in this case, I'd like to send through the data of the current sales user that I've just clicked. So for the data I'll be sending, this will be the current sales customer. And because the data of a customer matches the data type I've set on my page, this is going to be a perfect match. Now, let's say someone has clicked on a customer that they want to view and they've been redirected through to our dedicated customer page and the data of that customer has been sent through in our workflow. How can we now choose to display all of that information on our page for that specific customer? What I'd like to do before I actually build out this page is just show you a quick preview of what we're going to be creating today. So over in a separate bubble editor here, this is just a bit of an overview of what we're going to be building. So at the top of my page, I'm going to be displaying the name of the company that this customer is. So this is just the account name. Then below this, I have almost like this card or a tile that displays all of the customer's information followed by a series of buttons. And eventually today, we're gonna to go on to build out a way to add activity events to this customer's account, just so that way we can log things like when we've contacted the customer, or perhaps we could even update when we've closed the sale. And so the very first element I'd like to add onto our new page is just going to be this heading. So I'm gonna jump back into my new bubble editor, and I'm gonna to choose to add a text element at the top of my page. And as you've just seen on our existing page, the first thing I'd like to do is actually add an icon element in front of of this text. And of course, when we're adding icon elements into our text element, we'll just need to structure a small snippet of HTML. So in order to do that, I'm going to add an open square bracket, followed by the letters FA, then a closed square bracket. 
I'm then going to type in the name of the icon I'd like to display. In this case, mine's just going to be a user icon. And in this case, I just like to type in the word user just because I know that that is the name of the icon I'd like to reference. I'll then add another open square bracket followed by a forward slash, then the letters FA and then a close square bracket. And that will of course format to be a user icon. Then from here, what I'd like to do is display the name of the company whose customer profile we're viewing. So what I can do is choose to insert dynamic data. And what you'll now see is that because we've set a type of content on this page to be a customer, we can reference this value known as the current page customer. So if you remember in our workflow, when we were sending someone through to this page, we had actually sent the data of the current sales customer. So the current page customer now is going to be that customer we've sent through to this page, hence why it's called the current page customer. So I'm gonna select this option here, and then I'm gonna to choose to display the company name of that customer. I'm then going to remove the style of this text just because I'd like to update the font size. And in this case, I'm gonna set the font size to be 24. I'll also choose to bold this text. And then finally, I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab because I'd like to make this element fully responsive. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'll set the minimum width as zero, leaving the maximum width as infinite. So that way it's gonna take up as little or as much space as it possibly can on my page. I'm also gonna update the minimum height to be zero. And because we have the option selected here to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it's going to collapse nicely around the text. And then finally, the very last change I'd like to make to this text element is that I want to add some margins around it. So I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. I won't add any at the bottom, but I'll also add in 20 on the left and 20 on the right here. From here, I'm then going to add a group element onto my page, which is going to house all of the information about this customer. So I'm gonna scroll on down to my containers menu. I'll choose to add a group onto my page. And the very first thing I'd like to do with this group is jump over to my appearance tab. And I'm just gonna to choose to remove the style of this group. I'm gonna update the background style to be a flat color. And I'm gonna leave that as white. I'll then update the roundness of this group's borders to be 20. So that way it has some curved edges. And then finally, we'll also jump over to our layout tab so we can update the width of this group. So I'm gonna open this up. And before I do that, of course, I'll need to update the container layout. Now, if you remember from my example in my other bubble editor, everything in this group is going to be stacked from top to bottom. So I'm gonna set the container layout to be a column because we're stacking elements vertically. I'm going to then scroll on down to our width and unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, but when it comes to the maximum width, I'm not gonna leave that as infinite. Instead, I'm gonna set that as 600 pixels. Now, the reason why I've selected 600 is purely just a personal preference. There's no specific reason why I've selected that. By all means, you could change that to whatever you would like. Just make sure that you have enough space to add in all of your elements. And at this point, that is all of the settings I just wanna update. I will come back and update my height and margins in a moment. But before I do that, I'm gonna to need to add all of my elements inside of this group. And the very first element is just going to be a text element. That's just going to display the contact name for this customer's account. So I'm gonna add a text element into my group. Now, before this text, I'd like to add in yet another icon. I'm gonna be adding in quite a few icons throughout this particular section in our tutorial. So I'm just gonna add an open square bracket, the letters FA followed by a closed square bracket. Then I'll need to add in the name of the icon I'd like to display. Now, if you wanted to find the name of a specific icon, as I've mentioned in a previous module, all you need to do is head to your visual elements and add an icon element anywhere on your page. And whenever you select an icon, what you'll see is the name of it here. So that's where I'm gonna be referencing the names of the icons that I'm going to add into this particular group. I'm just gonna delete this icon for now though, because I'm gonna add in an icon known as user dash circle. I'm then gonna add an open square bracket followed by a forward slash and the letters FA and then a closed square bracket. And what you'll see is that it now displays a user icon within a circle. Now, I just know the name of this icon because I'd previously gone through the icon library and sourced that out. And by all means, these icons I use aren't mandatory. Feel free to use whatever icon you would like. But beside this icon, I'm just gonna add in the word contact followed by a semicolon. I'm then going to insert in dynamic data because I'd like to display the contact name 
of the person on this customer account. So I'm gonna to choose to insert dynamic data and I'm gonna once again reference the current page customer. So that is the customer whose profile we're viewing. I'm going to select the contact name field here and that's just going to add in that text element. Now, when it comes to this text, what I'd like to do is actually just bold a small section of this text. I'm only gonna to want to bold both the icon as well as the contact text. I don't want to bold the dynamic data. And so if I was to remove the style of this text and choose to bold this, what you'll see is that it's automatically going to bold every bit of that text. Whereas, as I mentioned, I only want the first part to be in bold. So I'm just going to undo a few steps here. And in order to just bold a small section of our text, I'm gonna select this option to open up a rich text editor. And that's now going to display the text we have here. And we can customize the formatting of this. So I'm going to highlight just the very first section of static text, and I'm gonna to choose to bold the formatting. I'll then choose to save this. And what you'll then see is that within our text element here, Bubble has automatically added some HTML to this text. So now it has successfully bolded just the very first word as well as the icon. And that's the exact experience I wanna create. Moving on from here, I will just need to jump to my layout tab and of course update the responsive settings of this element. So I'm going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I will set the minimum width as zero. And like any text element, I'm also going to leave the maximum width as infinite. So that way it can become as small or as large as it needs to be inside of this group. I'll also just remove the height here. I'm gonna set the minimum height as zero. And of course that will collapse nicely around the text inside of it. And then finally, I'm gonna add in 20 pixels of margin at the top. 20 on the left and 20 on the right. And that is the very first text element I'd like to add into our group. Below the customer's contact name, what I'd like to do is display their email address. And in order to streamline that whole process, I'm just gonna make a copy of this existing text element. I'm gonna select in my white group and paste in a new version. Only when it comes to this text, I'll just need to update a few quick things. The first thing I'll need to change is of course the icon I'm displaying within this text field. In this case, I'm just going to update the name of the icon. So I'm gonna keep all of the additional HTML formatting here. Instead, I'm just going to backspace the user circle text and I'm just going to add in the name of our inbox icon. Now again, the reason why I know that this is called the inbox icon is because I've already taken the time to go through our icon library. So I just knew what I was gonna be typing in. I'm also then just going to scroll across to our static text. So this is the word contact, which is currently in bold. And I'm just going to backspace that word and just type in the word email instead. Then from here, when it comes to the dynamic data, all I'll need to do is update the field I'm displaying for the current page user. So I'm going to update the contact name to instead be the contact email. And that's all I'll need to change here. One small preference I might also like to update is that if I jump to my layout tab, I'm just gonna update the top margin to be 15, not 20. Just because when it comes to these two text elements, I might like to position these a little bit closer together. But below this text element, I'd like to add in yet another. So to streamline that process, I'm gonna make a copy of our existing text. I'm going to then select in our white group and paste a version of that in. And for this text, I'm gonna to jump to our appearance tab and I'm gonna have this display the customer's contact number. Only of course, the first thing I'll need to do is just update the name of the icon I'm displaying. And in this case, I just like to display a phone icon. So I'm just going to backspace the word inbox and I'm gonna type in the word phone. It will then update this icon to be a little phone icon. And of course, I'll need to update the word email. I'm just going to have this display the word number. And also from there, I'll need to update the dynamic field I'm displaying. And for this, I'm going to show the current page customer their contact number. It's nice and straightforward. Now, because I've duplicated our second text element in our white group, it has also copied across the top margin. So it's currently set at 15, which means I don't need to change this. What I'd like to do though, is just make another copy of this text element because within this group, I'd also like to display the deal stage for this particular customer. And so the first thing I'm gonna update is the name of the icon. I'm going to backspace the word phone and type in the word dollar and that's just going to display a little money icon. And I apologize, I previously just said that I want to add in the deal stage. Instead, before I do that, I'm going to have this display the words deal size. So this is going to show what the potential account size is. So this is the dollar value linked to this account. I will be displaying the deal stage in a moment, but I'm just gonna quickly link this to be the deal size first. And then in order to display that dollar amount, I'm going to update the dynamic field here 
to of course be the deal size. Now in our database, technically the deal size is saved as a number, whereas I'd like to format this as a currency. So I'm just gonna select this more option here and choose to format this number as, and I'm gonna update this to be a currency. I'm going to set the currency prefix to be dollars just because that is the currency used in my country. And then I'm gonna add a thousand separator on this and I'm gonna leave that as a comma just so that way if the deal is quite large, it's just going to structure this quite nicely. I'm then gonna to choose to close this here because that's all I'll need to change. And it's now below this that we can add in the fields for our deal stage and our deal status. In fact, I think first I'd like to add in the deal status field. So I'm just going to make a copy of this text once again. And of course, once that has copied across, I'm gonna update the icon name. I'm going to remove the word dollar and I'm gonna type in the word check dash square. That will then update the icon to be a little check inside of a square as the name would suggest. Then I'm going to update the words deal size to just be the word status. And then finally for the dynamic data, I'm going to have this display the current page customer, the customer status. Now, if you remember this customer status field is linked to an option set. So in order to display the customer status itself, I'm going to need to reference the display text of that option set. And that's just going to format that as text, which is now looking good to me. I'm then gonna make another copy of this. And this is where we're finally going to display the deal stage. So I'm going to update the icon name. I'm gonna have this be the warning icon. It will update that of course. And then I'm gonna update the word status to instead display the word stage. And from here, I'll update the dynamic data to display the current page customer, their deal stage. So the customer stage, it's display text, because once again, that was linked to an option set list as well. And now that is all of the information I'd like to display about this customer's company. The very last field I'd like to add into our group though, is just who the account owner is for this customer. So I'm gonna make one last copy of our text element here. I'll paste that in. And when it comes to this text element, I actually don't want Want to display an icon in front of it. So what I'm going to do is choose to clear all of this text here. So I'm going to right click on all of my dynamic data and choose to clear that expression. I'm then going to just hold in the backspace key and remove all of this text. And instead, I'm just going to start fresh by typing in the words account owner, followed by a semicolon. I'll then choose to insert dynamic data and display the current page customer, the account owner which of course is linked to a user. So I'm going to display the user's name. Now, when it comes to this text, I would like to still bold the static text. So the account owner. So I'm gonna open up my rich text editor once again. I'm gonna highlight this text at the beginning and I'm gonna choose to bold that. I'll then choose to save this. And I might just like to make this text slightly larger. So I'm going to remove the default style. And for this text, I'm just gonna set the font size here to be 16. And that is the very last element I'd like to add into this group, which means that I'm just gonna to need to add in a bottom margin for this text element. So I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab, scroll on down to my margins. And I'm gonna add in a bottom margin of 20 pixels. And then from here, I'm gonna select on the white group itself. I'll head to its layout tab, and I'd like to update its minimum height to now be zero. And of course, because the default option is selected here to fit the height of this element to the content inside of it, it will collapse nicely around that last text element. And while we're in the layout tab for our group, I'm just gonna add in a top margin of 20. I'll leave the bottom margin, but I'll also add in a left margin of 20 and a right margin of 20. And that is how we can display all of a customer's details here. Below this, what I'd like to do is just add in two quick buttons, which we're not gonna create any workflows for right now, but it's just going to give us a nice head start in our next module when we go to either edit the details of this customer or even delete this customer. And when it comes to these two buttons, I'd like to display them side by side which means that in order to display two elements horizontally on our page, I'm gonna to need to add a group and set its container layout to be a row. So I'm gonna scroll on down to our containers menu here. I'm gonna select a group element and I'm gonna add this onto our page. Now, before I make any changes to the layout settings, I'm just gonna quickly jump to my appearance tab and I'm going to remove the style of this group and just give it a flat background color. And I'm gonna make this a light shade of red for the time being, just so I can clearly determine where it sits on my page. 
I'm also then just gonna jump to my layout tab. I'm going to update the container layout here to be a row because as I mentioned, I'm gonna want to position two elements side by side. And when it comes to the width of this group, I will update this in a moment, but I'm just gonna leave it at the current settings for the time being because right now I just wanna add my two buttons into this before I do anything else. So I'm going to scroll on up to my visual elements and I'm gonna add a button element into my red group. And this button's just going to display the word edit. And that's all I'll need to change within my appearance tab. I would just like to jump to my layout tab though, because I'd like to update the width of this button. I'm gonna set the width of this button to be 100 pixels. And look, I am gonna leave that as a fixed width because I'm only ever gonna want it to be 100 pixels, regardless of how small or large the page is. Then when it comes to the height, I'm gonna set the minimum height here to be 35, and that's just going to collapse the actual height itself. And then finally, I'm going to vertically align this in the center of my red group. And that's all I'll need to add for this button. I would just like to make a copy of this button though. So I'm going to select that, choose to make a copy, and then select in my red group and paste in another version. And when it comes to this button, I'm going to jump to my appearance tab and I'm gonna have this display the word delete. Now for this button here, I actually want to update the style of this to be the inverse of my existing blue button. So instead of having a blue background, I'd like it to have a white background with a blue text inside of it. So in order to change that, I could just remove this existing style and create a one-off pattern. But if I'm creating the inverse of the main button, I might like to create that as a design style. So that way I can easily reference that again at any point in my application that I would like. So I'm just going to select this outline button style here. And as you can see, this is already kind of the similar style that I was looking to create. Only what I'm gonna do is just choose to edit this style here. And within this style, what I would like to do is first of all, update the font color. I'm gonna set this to be the same blue that I've been using throughout my existing application today. So if you'd like that color, it's 009 EDB. I'm then going to leave the background style as it is, but I'd also like to update the border style here. So for the border, I'm gonna update the color once again to be the same blue color code as the text. And finally, the very last thing I will need to change is also just the line spacing here. It's currently set at 1.4, whereas I need to set this as one. Now, the reason I know that is because if I jump to my design tab here, if I was to edit the existing style of our primary button, what you'll also see is that the line spacing here is one. So I wanna make sure that these two buttons are the same size, which I can now see that they are. Finally though, I'd also just like to add in some space between these two buttons. So I'm gonna select on my delete button here. I'm gonna to jump to my layout tab and I'm just gonna add in 10 pixels of margin on the left. That's all I'll need to change. I'll then select on my overall red group here. And this is where we can update all of the remaining settings in our layout tab. So when it comes to the width of this group, I am going to unselect that this should be a fixed width. I'm gonna set the minimum width as zero, but instead of just leaving the maximum width as infinite, I'm going to tick this option to fit the width of this element to the content inside of it. And that's going to collapse nicely around my buttons. I'm also gonna do the exact same thing for the height. So I'm gonna set the minimum height to be zero. And now you'll see that that will snap perfectly around our two buttons as well. And the very last thing I will need to change here is just the margins. I'm gonna add in 10 pixels of margin at the top, 20 on the left, and then 20 on the right. And that actually concludes everything I wanted to add on this page at this point in time. As I mentioned, we're not gonna actually build out the workflows to power these two buttons just yet. I wanna save those for the next module in our tutorial. What I would love to do though, is just run ahead and show you a preview of what this page is gonna look like whenever I want to view the full details of a customer's account. Over in a preview of my page here, let's say I want to go ahead and view the full details of John Smith's account. I'm gonna select anywhere inside of this group and it's going to run that workflow and send me through to my dedicated customer page. And what you'll now see is that because our workflow has sent through the data of John, I'm now successfully displaying all of his details on this page. So I can see the potential deal size for this customer, as well as the status and the deal stage. I can also see that I'm the account owner for this customer as well. And that is how simple it is to display a customer's details on a dynamic page. What I'd love to do is just jump back into our Notion checklist and tick off that we've finished bringing this feature to life. And that is all I have time to include within this tutorial today. As you can see, we've been building for hours and there's still so many features that I wanna walk through. 
At this point, we still need to build out the feature that allows us to edit the details of a customer, as well as create a fully functional navigation menu within our app. And of course, we also need to build out our activity log feature on our dedicated customer page before we then go on and build out the sales dashboard to display all of our sales figures. If you were interested in watching the rest of this course, I'd recommend hitting the link in the description of this video. That's gonna take you through to my website where you can get access to the full course itself. Now, while this full course is going to cost you money, I'm confident that it's gonna save you months of time having to learn how to rebuild all of these additional features from scratch. So if you're new to Bubble, I definitely think it's gonna be worth your time. In the meantime though, if you wanted to stay up to date with any additional Bubble courses I share, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that way you can be the first to know whenever I drop a new tutorial. But for now, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for taking the time to watch this tutorial and I wish you all of the best on your own no-code journey.